We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Andre, and I'm here with... Rob H. This is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. And hopefully, fingers crossed, if things go as we are hoping and planning, uh, this will be the first of two episodes this week. Uh, but right. I think, I don't know, I, maybe we'll just leave the going with second that. one for a surprise. Hopefully it'll work yeah. out, but no promises. So if it doesn't happen, uh, you never knew what you missed. <laughs> Yeah, we're not predicting the future nope. anymore in this podcast. We're done with that. Nope. Not making any jokes about any years. Yeah. Not flippantly referring to the future as in any terms whatsoever. Just, I'm done. We are most with definitely that. not clairvoyant. We did not see anything no. of last week's events happening. Once again, I guess if people are watching this far into the future, uh, last week was the week that uh, some rioters in the United States attacked the uh, Capitol buildings and the Senate floor and all of that stuff. That That is the historical right. context of the comments we are making today. And uh, yeah, and we what, made comments about it on on a Monday and or on the Tuesday yeah. and then Wednesday it happened right. and then we published the podcast on Friday. That's right. So it happened in between. I was actually uh, mountain biking with a friend of mine. First time I've ever mountain biked in my mm. life. Uh, I mean, I've ridden bikes. Sure obviously uh but uh, and then when i was a kid i had the bmx bikes and i used to try to jump over stuff but it wasn't ever like that okay. so this friend of mine invited me to go with him and uh, i was like yeah I'm sure whatever i'll try it uh didn't die clearly <laughs> but did uh did crash pretty Ooh. heavily uh once Ooh. uh so i've uh i didn't break anything yeah but I got some good some good bruises Ooh. here and there. The the most annoying of which is that I he lent me these shoes. Yeah. Uh, he lent me the bike. He lent me everything yeah. basically. Yeah. I have cycling equipment for street biking, but you know for riding, I don't know what you call them. Street bikes ten. I call them ten speeds because I'm a thousand years old. <laughs> but uh, uh, you know I, I cycle with a friend of mine on you know around here all the time. But uh, this is the first time I did that. So he lent me these shoes and they're like really stiff. I mm -hmm. guess for pedaling mm -hmm. it makes it easier to pedal and stuff like that it's not so hard on your ankles but uh they also are really good for landing mm. in when you go careening off the side of a thing that you were supposed to turn but yeah i didn't make the turn i just went straight off of it and i see yeah so i didn't die ah. but i am limping but when i left it was before the thing okay at the capital <laughs> and, when, and when i got back in the car i texted my wife i said i'm done and she said have you listened to the news yet and I went, no. She's like, well, if you see any armed caravans on the right. highway, steer clear. I was Indeed. like, okay. <laughs> so it's been that kind of day. So I apologize. Uh, we don't, we don't, whatever want to get political on this podcast is not what this is about. It's about uh, informing people and educating people about home theater and getting their questions answered. And that's what we'll do. Uh, but we hope that in uh, other aspects of your life, you also stay informed and always seek knowledge because that's what we do here. And we're uh, uh, not afraid to admit when we've uh, thought something for a long mm -hmm. time, like how to play sub subwoofers back in the day. And then some new research comes out and says that we should do it in a different way. And we look at it and we go, yep, that makes sense. We were wrong. Let's change our opinion. So we hope that all of our listeners are those same kinds of people. Evidence-based opinions. Yes, that's what that's what we believe mm -hmm. around here. That's what we that's how, that's what we stand for. I will tell you up front, I am under caffeinated, <laughs> so I am drinking soda. Which I mean, I think it's just certainly make make me burp. <laughs> so I apologize. I think it's just a standing thing now burp. that you're pretty much always tired on this podcast. No matter what day, no matter what I, time we record. I can't. It, no matter what time. If yeah, you're after ever this feeling, podcast, if I had the option, I would take a if nap. If you're ever feeling good and wide awake and alert, that's what you should let us know now, because that will be the difference from the norm. Honestly, honestly, it's it's I'm it, I'm rush 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 yeah. rush all day to get here. <laughs> And then once I get here, I, I you know like when you're when you're when your adrenaline's up trying to get everything done and you get done and then you finally get done sure. with everything, you kind of sit down, and you kinda of collapse into yeah, your chair. Yeah. That's the way I feel at the beginning of this podcast. 
every time. So that's why I always say I'm tired. That and the fact that we used to record this at like 9, 10 o'clock at we night. We did. And then I was quite literally tired. But uh, by the end of the podcast, I'm usually running around again on adrenaline because we've been doing the podcast and I'm all hyped up. So nobody worry about me. I don't have sleep apnea and I'm not, you know, <laughs> I, don't, I don't I don't have any, you know, sleep problems. I do have sleep problems. My wife, she keeps waking me up and telling me to stop snoring. <laughs> But that's not a problem I can really do anything about, except for the snoring part. But uh, yeah, that that's not going to happen either. So, all right, let's, let's, let's not talk about this anymore. Let's get to talk about AV. Let's, so this is let's uh, get hyped. Yes, let's get hyped. Let's get pogged, but not with oh, the emote. No, yeah. Can't do that anymore. No, the emote. Let's leave it all alone. <laughs> it's all. We're not talking about any of this stuff. I don't want to talk about it. It's terrible. Everything's uh, terrible. It's all a dumpster fire. 2020 20, 20, 20, will be better. Two. <laughs> the, re- the return of 2020. It's like Jaws 3, the year. Yep. <laughs> it's, just, it's just, you're like, I hope it'll be better. And then you'll watch it and go, oh. I was just, I wasn't, it wasn't any good. <laughs> This is AV Rant, the podcast that answers your home theater and AV questions. To get your questions answered, all you have to do is ask. You ask by emailing us a question at avrant.com. Go to avrant.com. You can leave us a comment there, facebook.com slash avrantpodcast, youtube.com slash avrant. Contact Rob directly at rob at avrant.com. His Twitter is at first reflect. Tom at avrant.com. My Twitter is at avrant underscore Tom. Though, again, if you want your question on this podcast and we are happy to answer mm-hmm. them, you must send it to question at avrant.com. Dot that com. is the place. That's the, that, that is the place. We want to thank our listeners of the week, as we do every week. Our listeners of the week are people who support the podcast in some way. One of the ways you can do that is go into avrant.com and click on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link. There you can go. It will take you to a PayPal donation site where you can use your PayPal account or a credit card to stay anonymous because we don't see any of that. Uh, and uh, you give us some money. Mm-hmm. And PayPal will take a little bit, but we'll get most of it. So we want to thank Brian, Julian, Lee, and Dale for doing that this week. Thank you, Brian, Julian, Lee, and Dale. Yeah, that's very nice. Brian, Julian, Lee, and Dale, thank you all very much for those uh, donations via PayPal. We really do appreciate that. And if you want to support us financially but don't want to have to remember every once in a while to go over to our site and find the PayPal link and all that, you can go to patreon.com slash podcast. There you can sign up to be a, 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 a continuing member or subscriber or supporter of the podcast. Continuing supporter. Ongoing support. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I'm going to get something. I need to write something there so I know what to call this <laughs> stupid thing. Patreon.com. Uh, every month, I'll take a little bit of money from you and uh, or however much you say and give a little bit to themselves and a lot to us. I don't I remember the exact breakdown. It's like 70, no, it's 80, 20, I don't know, ah. something like that. I don't remember what it is. No idea. I don't know. So we want to thank our 125 current patrons over at Patreon.com. Thank you very much, all of yes, you. Yes, indeed. Patreon.com slash Podcast for anyone who might like to sign up. I call it a voluntary subscription. So 125 patrons oh, yeah. over there. That's very nice. And uh, thank you very much for the financial support. If we were higher, I don't know what we would have to be, more motivated, higher achieving people we would we would we would do something special for our patrons and you know like answer their questions first or something but that's we just rather keep on i'm not keeping track of those questions <laughs> I, I know i don't i don't blame you all right but if you can't so if you don't want to support us or you can't support us financially we understand just find some way to support us and let us know what you did and we'll mention it here so jeremy and mario sent me photos to be used on av gadgets uh, if you haven't seen your photo on av gadgets don't worry. It may show up. It may not. It's in the There's bank. No guarantee I'll for use it. Potential future I, use. That's right. Like I say, I name it based on your name, uh, so that I n- know who to who gave it mm-hmm. to me, and then what it reminds me of, so that I know that. So when I search for it, that's what I'll be searching for. So you may have sent me like three pictures of your home theater, but one more prominently shows the subs. So I'll put subs, and the other one shows the screen or something or screen. Uh, that sort of thing. I've got pictures of the backs of people's you know, ports, just like any random remotes, any random little thing that you think I might someday, like, I, I what was I searching for the other day? Uh, like the output on the HDMI that says ARC. Sure. I was searching for an image of that. 
<laughs> because I wanted to show it, but you can't find it because you have to like steal it out of a denim manual, which is what I ended up doing. <laughs> but stuff like that. So we got uh, we got uh, Jeremy and Mario sent me some stuff. So thank you, Jeremy and Mario. Yeah, I'm very sure you'll be using Jeremy's because this is the curtain skirt that we like so much, and there are no I other mentions it. of it anywhere <laughs> on the internet. So uh, Jeremy will definitely be getting credit for that. And uh, I already used Mario it, yeah. is uh, written in about uh, various electrical concerns at uh, National Electric Code, at least for the United States. So that might right. crop up again right. as well. Thank you for sending those in. I'm actually, yeah. I'm actually going to use that yeah. one as well. Uh, we also got some notes of gratitude for keeping the podcast going from Jack, Terry, Patrick, Brian, Dave, who's part of the Two Hour Plus Club, who wouldn't listen to the whole, he says, who wouldn't listen to the whole show. <laughs> yeah. You don't listen to any of the shows. So there you go. I don't listen to any of the shows. <laughs> if you're on YouTube, you saw me raise my hand. If you're not, virtually, you must have felt it the, through the forest. I've been watching The Mandalorian, so I'm right. like super Star Wars guy right now. So we've got, uh, and Jason and Dale. So that's Jack, Terry, Patrick, Brian, Dave, Jason, and Dale. So thank you very much for thanking And us. I'll just repeat the names. Jack, Terry, Patrick, Brian, Dave, Jason, and Dale. Thank you very much for those notes of gratitude and encouragement. It is appreciated right now. Uh, last Wednesday was not the way. That was, that was not the way. That was not the way. No, it was no. not. Uh, but we've had CES going on, so uh, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna do some news, some CES twenty twenty one news to CES. That's exciting. <laughs> I don't know any of this stuff because I've been so busy <laughs> writing other things and dealing with other I stuff. Tried, my wife, I tried my to wife, organize it and keep it concise. <laughs> my wife, my wife takes a break from Facebook because she gets angry and you know upset and stuff, and then she, all she does is look over my shoulder or ask me mm. what's going on. I'm like. It's just not curious. It defeats the purpose. Yeah. All right. Before we get into the CES 2021, we have to mention the most devastating news the home theater world has ever witnessed. Mm -hmm. Come June 30th, Netflix will no longer work on the Nintendo Wii U. <gasps> That's right. Don't isn't that only a composite connection anyway? Uh, no, <laughs> the Wii, the Wii U had HDI. an HDMI output, and it could go okay. up to uh, 720p. So, you know, Ooh. everyone who was going for tip-top quality was busting out their Wii U, all 10 people who ever bought one. But uh, you can't watch Netflix on that Wii U anymore after June 30th. So that, that had to be mentioned. Very important. <laughs> how, small of, how small of a footprint does it have to have to, for Netflix not to work on it anymore? <laughs> like, they must be able to tell who's using what device, and they must look at the Wii U and go, we're not updating this crap yeah. anymore. <laughs> That's not working. Not going to keep that working. <laughs> All right, uh, so CES 2021. Uh, Ankyo and Pioneer are apparently alive after all. Good to know. At CES 2021, they announced seven new receiver models, four from Ankyo, three from Pioneer, with HDMI 2.1 and either seven or nine channels of amplification built in. The two highest model numbers announced by Ankyo, the TXNR7100 and the TXRZ50, also inc include DRAC Live for room correction. No prices or release dates yet. So that's... Exciting. Yeah, that's the onkyo. I mean, I'm just going to keep going. Is yeah, yeah, we'll okay. just roll through these like they're we'll just roll through busting these. through headlines. All right. <laughs> All right, so we already talked about LG's QNED mini LED LCD TVs, which will use tens of thousands of mini LED backlights grouped into as many as 2,500 local dimming zones. Those now have a convenient model name, so QNED 90. I am totally calling the QNED. And yeah. They couldn't have found an R to put in there someplace because Q Nerd would be a TV I would buy. <laughs> nice. Q Ned for the 4K version and Q Ned 95. Q Ned 90 Q for 4K. Q Ned 95 for the 8K. They also have a new version of Web OS 6.0 that takes up the whole screen now. I don't know if that's good or mm -hmm. bad. And the Magic Remote has a new look and NFC built in. NFC. Oh, so you can just put it on top of a charger and it charges. Uh, well, no, it's mainly that, uh, like, Oh, is that for Bluetooth? Connection? Yeah, it's it's no. for what like it's for like casting. So you bring something up on your smartphone and then you tap it to your magic remote, and NFC will connect the two things without you having to press a button on your smartphone. Go to the the, the cast button. You can yeah, just do that. Just okay, well, I guess remote. that's that's a thing that yeah. I would use almost never who knows <laughs> I mean, like they put it in there every once in a while <laughs> all right not to be outdone in uh, the realm of bad names oh, this one i found i yeah. almost threw up on my screen uh i wrote about this on navy gadgets as well uh samsung is upgrading to mini led uh backlights for their top end q led or q led q led tvs and calling them neo q led That's right 
Look for a QN at the end of their model name if you want the mini LED uh, Neo goodness. And they come with a solar powered remote, which I also wrote about. Yeah. This is about the only two interesting. But this war, and I think that what we, people should be looking at this and saying, hey, um, uh, you know, what does this mean with Samsung and LG kind of going at each other here? LG is doing a fantastic job of baiting Samsung into getting into, into an LCD war. We've had <laughs> LCDs versus plasmas, and plasmas kind of got killed, and LCDs versus OLEDs, which people kind of understand the difference between those two things. But now it's like, QLED versus QNED versus Neo QLED, mm -hmm. and everybody's like, you know, now we've got a kind of format war within the LCD, and I, I don't think that bodes well for the LCDs <laughs> in general, but that's my personal opinion. So LG saw the Neo QLED and said, Hold my beer, here comes OLED Evo. Mm -hmm. That's the name they've given their new brighter OLED panels, which will only be in the G1 series. There's actual performances, uh, performance differences between the LG OLED series now. Uh, the Z1 is still 88K or 77 or 88 inches. The G1 keeps the gallery design and gets the brighter OLED Evo panels. Evo, does, it's not like the Dragon Ball <laughs> Z movie, right? <laughs> Isn't that what they called it? Dragon Ball... Oh, Evo or something? I don't know. Revolutions something has something? definitely had Evo in it, but yeah, yeah, that's what they're doing. I don't know. So the C1 is the obvious bread and butter and adds the new 83-inch size option. A new A1 series plans to draw uh, drops to a 60 hertz panel to hit lower price points than ever before. LG Display also plans to start manufacturing smaller sizes with a 42-inch plan for this year. So the entry level is the A1 yes. and then this the C1 yeah. and then the G1. Z1. G1 is better than, is not as good as the Z1? Correct. Yeah, because okay. the G1, Z... G1 and then Z1. Yeah, because Z1 is okay. the 8K. That's the only 8K series is the Z. Ah. Yep. <laughs> that's it. That's how it goes. After 10 Stop. came 1. <laughs> we're back to 1 now. Samsung, the, okay. the last letter now, because the, they were up to T last year in 2020, and now the last letter in the 2021 models will be A. They're, they're back to the beginning of the alphabet. So many, many companies have just circled back around. All right. TCL decided 8K is the thing. Last year's uh, R635 series is going to stick around another year, while the new 648 uh, series added... 13 to it whatever turns the popular 6 series into an 8k offering ltcl was already using mini leds so now they've slimmed it down with the tech they're calling od0 optical distance zero <laughs> please stop people <laughs> Just stop. I got to put it in I have there. To read That's these what things. Called. I got to read they're these things. You got to do think think of the poor podcasters out there. They got to right. read this stuff. The listeners who are like, "What is he saying?" Exactly. Neo QLED they're also OLED Evo OD0. <laughs> there you go. Got to keep it clear. Uh, please kill me. <laughs> <laughs> and they're also going big, announcing their first 85-inch models and calling them the XL Collection. Well, okay. That one I'll give you. I'll give you XL. I under Everybody That's understands right. that. <laughs> and last and kind of least, Sony's A90J uh, Master Series OLED will have the brighter OLED tech at up to 83 inches, which is uh, LG's G1 series tops out at a 77-inch size. But other than that, Sony didn't do much this year besides simplify their model numbers. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Thank they're you no that. longer different in Europe versus Australia versus North America. They're like, oh, we can actually use one model number throughout the entire world. Yes. <laughs> Welcome, welcome to the you know, international tra you know, trade. That's about time. Uh, they simplify. Okay, no mini LEDs, no Neo, no Evo. Uh, but they didn't want to miss out on dumb names, so they hyped up their new cognitive processor XR for their Bravia XR TVs. Yeah. Um, which, whatever that is, I don't even care. That actually leads us into a trend this year. Last year, filmmaker mode, which turns off all motion processing and aims for accuracy, was kind of the buzzword this year. All the TV makers have pulled in 180 and talking about their AI, deep learning, or cognitive processors that aim to analyze images in real time and process the heck out of them, make, make colors pop and faces stand out. Infinite Gary asked about that. Are they actually talking about blurring the background so people stand out more? We don't. We don't. We don't. I mean, the, it's just edge they, they are. Yeah, it's it's another form of edge enhancement. That's all. It it's just. Is. A, I mean, they, they can call it whatever they want. It's just going to be edge enhancement and and brightness, adaptive brightness. Yep. You know, it's what they're kind of going for. It's dynamic contrast. It's edge enhancement. 
there's nothing new under the sun as far as that goes. That's that's all that is. Which I forget which company it was that last year was all like, yeah, filmmaker mode. We're supporting filmmaker mode. We're gonna have the accurate colors, the accurate motion. And then this year at CES, they're like, we're enhancing the colors. We're enhancing the motion. We're enhancing the contrast on everything. That's what people want, apparently. So you can read that as well. That didn't yeah, sell. Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's, so. try let's, go, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. This other way. Um, it, it, Gary and everybody else. This is just going to be another thing that you're going to turn off. Yeah. Okay? That's all, all it is. It's just a thing you're going to turn off. So perhaps, perhaps a little more reason to consider an X, uh, a Sony Bravia XR model. Sony Core is now their streaming service, which will only be found on Bravia XR TVs. At least at launch, it'll have, only have movies from Sony Pictures. But the top, so you can see all the Spider Man. Yeah, the Spider Man movies. movies. That's pretty much it. Yeah, Jumanji. <laughs> that's in there. Yeah. Oh, the new Jumanji wasn't terrible. I saw uh, the second, one, I guess, second the, the sequel to the remake. Whatever, yes. it was okay. <laughs> But the talking point is that Sony Core will be the first streaming service with bit rates, bit rates up to 80 uh, megabits per second for nearly ultra HD Blu-ray quality. They only mention HDR10 and DTS 5.1 audio, though, but they promise the largest selection of IMAX enhanced titles. Which so, I would hope would indicate that you'd at least get DTS-X because that's what IMAX enhanced uses. But anyway, there's another streaming service coming. Sony Core. We. Oui. You can only get it on their TVs. <laughs> TV. <laughs> Better be free. I mean, if it's only on one TV, it's got to be free, right? Is it not free? I bet it's not free. Is it free? Uh, no, it's not free, as far as I know. There, there's, no. They said there'd be about 100 catalog titles that are free, and then uh, the rest you got to pay for. That's the idea. I was really going to, I was really looking forward to seeing Wonder Woman on right. HBO Max when I got the free s- trial, but then. It turned out to get terrible reviews. And it did. I don't want to watch it now. So <laughs> now I have to wait for something good. I don't to come have out HBO, HBO Max, Max in Canada, so I wasn't going to pay the, the per watch rental fee for right. stereo. Only. All right. Some comments here from our listeners. We, uh, we've got, if you're on YouTube, you can check out uh, Andrew's uh, latest model spaceship. It's the, he calls it the Disco Prize. It's a, it's just the Enterprise, but with like lights all over it. It's got like lights in the, it's, the, the what they call those, the, 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 the warp nacelles, cells. Yeah. Nacelles. It's got. It looks like the windows light up. It's got the bridges lit up. The edges are lit up. It's lit up all over the place. It's actually and the engines. Oh, yeah. And then the thrusters, whatever you call those, right? The thrusters Impulse on engines, the dish yeah, on the back. Yeah, the imp- I, mean, I haven't watched a Star Trek movie in forever. <laughs> I need to, need to go back and start watching. It's very cool looking. I really uh, like it. Yeah, it's the the version of the original Enterprise as depicted in Star Trek Discovery. That's that's why it's the Disco Prize. Oh. Uh... Not because it like has flashing lights or anything. I will say that this this room he is in, he's taking these pictures in angers me on a very visceral level because I don't have a single room in my house that's, that's this clean. <laughs> you know, oh. like nothing that nothing looks this good. All my all my rooms are dirty. Jason wanted to thank us for uh, diving into his room at Q uh, Wizard Measurements and discussing how to best ac- acoustically treat his room while preserving his aesthetics. He wants to make sure his wife gets credit for the looks of the theater, and he thinks our advice makes sense and is practical. He tried the clap test, and he doesn't hear any ring or zing, and treble detail has never been the issue. But uh, his room can sound a bit bassy or boomy, though, so after we said absorption to treat the 100 to 500 hertz range and not really any need for diffusion, that all seems to line up, so color-matched panels within the wainscoting and color-matched and or poster panels on the upper sections are a go. Should he treat the front and back walls or just the side walls? Yes, you should treat them all. Yep. I mean, the the front wall that he's got, I don't know how much practical room there really is there. The wainscoting part, you certainly could on the front wall. That'd be no problem. But definitely treat your back wall. For 100% sure, treat your back wall. Yep. Yeah. All right. uh, Questions. We only had the one comment this week, so here we go. Questions. David. Oh, David sent me these pictures and said I could use them on the Okay. Uh, we already thank him for that. Uh, no, because I, I didn't get that message, but I'll I'll put it in yes. there. Yes, uh, he sent he sent me these pictures. I had to, with one of them's a little crooked, I had to fix it. So David added uh, SVS PB4000 to his PB12+. Plus. He's got them both at the front of his room, but his room is open after doing a whole du- dual subwoofer setup. It works with this positioning. It is unintuitive how adding the second, even bigger subwoofer actually made the bass more subtle. As we've said, it initially seemed to get quieter, but he recognizes that it, it's in a good way as the bass is a lot more linear and even now. He's using a, a, 
a Denon X4300H receiver, and he has seven speakers in a 5.2.2 configuration. Uh, SVS Prime elevations are being used as his surrounds and top middles. I'm not. They're not like right next to each other. I don't, know I, I don't see so the, the placement behind him. Didn't, I didn't get any yeah, pictures of the back, the back of the room, of the room so yeah. I'm not sure. <laughs> this room like threw me for a loop because I was like, "Where are the speakers?" Because I think all three of them are in that they cabinet. They are in the up cabinet front. below gonna, the television. Yeah. That is where the speakers yeah. live. The ceiling at the front of his room is sloped down at an angle. So, do we think it makes sense to add? two more Atmos speakers. He's noticed the greater amount of Atmos content now. So if four overheads would be worth it, he would like to try it. But how would we suggest setting them up in this his situation? So I am going to assume that your top mills are to your sides and your surrounds are behind you. I'm not sure. He might have the top way. middles on the ceiling. That's that's a possibility. I'm not I'm not sure. That's true. It might be on the ceiling. Yeah. Okay. So I don't know how... So we're going to have to to make a similar... Because you didn't show us the back speakers. Yeah. So if you... Because he's... I thought he said that... Okay. Prime elevations are being used as his surrounds and top middle. That's so right. they can't be in ceilings because they're all prime elevations. Not in ceiling, speakers. but the, the top middles could be mounted on his ceiling because the ceiling is only sloped at oh. the front of the room. It's not sloped at the back of the room. So there's a possibility the top middles are mounted on on his but, ceiling uh, like yours are that could be so if he's got prime elevations for surrounds directly to his sides or maybe yeah. a little bit behind him and then on his ceiling the elevations yeah. on his ceiling uh they would be very close proximity which would be not what we would normally recommend but uh it is open so i don't know how he's got this thing done but uh you could put something up there i don't know that would go with elevation because of the angle of the ceiling, though. I mean, I theoretically, I, honestly, could. with what he already has, I would get another pair of prime elevations. I would put them on his ceiling, um, like closer to his seat, like just before the ceiling starts sloping down on the ceiling. Yeah, I, yeah. I just put them yeah, yeah. flat on the ceiling and have the little angle aiming toward you. That's that's all I would do there because you don't really have the space to put it on your front wall high enough. It would right. be fairly low on your front wall just because of the slope of the ceiling. I wouldn't put it on the slope itself because that's that's really pointing at you. So I would just put it yeah. on that flat part of the ceiling before the ceiling starts to slope and uh, use the little angle built in to, to have it angled toward you. Easy. You could do that, and then what you would call them, uh, front heights? You'd have to call them front heights. Yeah, you'd have to if you're calling the, the rear ones top middles, but that's fine. It's it's just steering left and right, front and back. Yeah. So yes, would in-ceiling speakers make sense? They wouldn't need to be terribly expensive, right? Could monoprice in ceilings get the job done? And yeah, they could. They could. You could do that as well. Yeah. You put them in the exact same spot. Yes. Uh, I would, if you're using, I'm, I'm going to be honest, if you're using elevation mm -hmm. speakers like to your sides, for your surrounds, then I would try to move the, you know, instead of having top middles, I would try to move those back behind you a little bit and call them, you know, rear heights and front heights. You could, you know, sure. Or do it that way, or top fronts, top rears or whatever. Uh, if you have your surrounds, if you have your height, your, I'm, I'm going to say this, if you have your top middles to your sides and then your surrounds behind mm -hmm. you, I would rename everything. Mm. I would just, I would take your surrounds and put them to your sides. What you were calling your surrounds, which are, were somewhere behind <laughs> you, I would call those rear heights, rear sure. heights or top rears, and then put these speakers exactly where Rob said and call them front heights or yeah, top fronts or whatever they call the things. So, yeah, there you go. It's it's a it'd be easier to talk about if we could actually see them. <laughs> so, all right. Mark, Mark is going to upgrade to dual SVS. SB3000 subs. He's provided a diagram with numbers uh, for potential locations. The positions marked A and B are where he has his current smaller subs, but those won't really work with the larger SB3000. So which two spots should he use? The room is uh, 17 feet front to back and 19 feet wide for the, the wider majority of the room. Uh, I'm, I'm going to guess that this opening in the back left is an actual opening like a closet, like a hallway or yeah something. i'm pretty the sure way, yeah there's there's no guess. indication of a door there and it doesn't look like there would be a door there because that looks like it's the entrance to the house is sort of like the right. uh uh back right corner is basically the entrance to the house and i'm pretty sure that's a hallway in the back left corner uh so yeah i got a pretty clear idea where i would put a couple of subs 
Right. So the, just for, so for people who can understand it, as you walk into that, as you open the door to the house, you would walk in, there'd be a wall to your left, directly to your left there that goes straight back probably into the kitchen and everything mm -hmm. else. To the right of you, you would see a, a couple of couches and the TV would be on the right wall. Mm -hmm. uh, then there's a picture window. If you were to walk in and turn 90 degrees to your right, you would be in front of the TV or facing the TV. To your right would be a picture window or I'm guessing it's a picture window and to your left would be a wall and then the hall the hallway the what would be the back left corner mm -hmm. of the room as you're facing that way uh, he's got uh, two couches it looks like and a seat a chair that's on the, one of the walls uh, but the spaces he's got marked out here for uh, would be the front left corner the front right corner sort of the back right corner uh but it's not really because the back right corner has a door so it would be in front of the door if that makes sense there's a little alcove sort yeah it's, of a, there. it's not quite and the then, middle of the right wall middle of the left wall it's a little bit back of the middle of the left wall middle of the right wall basically right so then you've got your uh your your fourth spot would be you know, if the, th if the third spot is directly to the right of the couch, all the way on the wall next to the picture window, the 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 fourth spot is to the left of the of the couch, all the way on the wall, mm -hmm. a little bit in front of that opening that leads in the back left corner that leads to the rest of the house. So, yeah, I mean, these are all reasonable locations, and there's no reason why you couldn't try them all with a long enough cable. That's right. So <laughs> there's, there's that. Um, I mean, out of the stuff I see right here, if I think it's either one, three, two, four. Uh, those are the ones I would be going oh, okay. with almost certainly. I I, but, I would uh, actually opt for three and four because that's basically the three of, basically the midpoints my, of the two side walls. In fact, since spot three uh, must be a little bit towards the back of the room from the actual midpoint of the right side wall, then spot four could actually be moved a little bit forward so that they're they're yeah. slightly diagonal to each other because it's just a single chair over on that left wall. Uh, but that was my my, there. my my backup would be uh, if if you do have any wiggle room with that chair, mm -hmm. I would just swap, you know, and try sure. to, and, and put the chair put the subwoofer on the other side of the chair and cheat the chair yeah. towards the back of the area, I guess would be the way to, yeah. to do it. Um, which would kind of give you, you know, mirrored midpoints of the side walls sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, I my, I, know, I mean, I, I've seen houses like this before. That wall that he's showing on the left might, in almost, it very well, couldn't be a partial wall, not a full mm. wall. If it's not a full, if that's the case, then you know, it, you really don't have an, right. very much of an enclosed <laughs> space here. And in in which case, you're going to have to go through Rob's twelve stick guide, no matter you what. You probably will so, anyway. But uh, yeah, yeah, going for sort of uh, essentially midpoints of the two side walls. That's that's where I would go. All right. Yeah works for me mm. jack jack has a 65 inch panasonic plasma rocking it old school mm -hmm. dude that thing's probably still rules an onkyo txnr 809 receiver and seven aperion intimus speakers in a 5.2.2 configuration with a pair of outlaw lfm1 subs that <laughs> the guy is like a poster boy for <laughs> AV rant suggestions yep i mean if the, i mean those the, we, we have recommended every single one of these yeah <laughs> These things, these things over the course of our life here. Uh, he recently added a Parasound P6 and A21 two-channel combo, and now he wants to upgrade his main left and right speakers. We have not recommended Parasound, mm. but you were doing good before that. <laughs> so he's willing to consider up to $5,000 for the pair, but he did not have it in mind to also upgrade his center, and he wants his existing center to still provide a reasonable timbre match. Uh, period. Okay. Auditioning speakers is a big challenge right now. So do we have any suggestions on for where to start a search? Uh, yeah, that's, this, you, you are correct, sir. Uh, going into a Best Buy and right. or you know, a high-end store right now to listen to speakers is problematic. <laughs> I think it, it's never been the best option to begin with, but it's certainly been our only option right now. It's, it's at that added level of danger, what with COVID going on. So, uh, you know, obviously the first thing you can do is you can order speakers from the people who, you know, ship them both ways sure. for free. So that's, that's SVS, the ultra series, which is, yep. you know, well with well within your price range uh again aperion yep then you could go to the varus grand the series grand, yep uh, would be the one the two that you would immediately want to go to uh those are the easiest ones to to immediately uh audition in home i mm -hmm. uh, would have no problems recommending those for sure uh 
the rest of it, you know, uh, Epirian as a whole is going for a, you know, a neutral sound, mm -hmm. a, a flat frequency response. So you're going to want to stay with speakers that have that sort of uh, timbre. But I wanted you know, you to address wanna... that. Like, he's got a very healthy budget. I see no reason why you can't get your front three speakers. Because, yeah. I mean, the Aperion Intimus, I like those speakers very much, but are they going right. to be the equivalent of speakers that you were considering up to $5,000 a pair? And the answer is no. So why... No. It doesn't make sense to me to try and basically say, well, here's the budget I have. I want really good front, left, and rights, but they have to still match my, what was it, like a $250 center, the Aperion cent uh, Intimus center? Like, to me, that doesn't make sense. When you've got a very healthy budget, why not get three really wonderful speakers? And then as surrounds, your Aperion Intimus speakers are still going to be fantastic if your front three speakers are still going for a neutral sound profile. So that, that's uh, what I would I, do. I, I think it's, I mean... I would pick this the the left and right speaker based, you know, in saying that you're going to spend up to five thousand dollars is fine. Right. It gives us a nice idea of what your budget is, but uh, there's no reason why you uh, need to try to push to the edge of that budget. No, no, no. Like if you went, all. what I'm saying is, if you went SVS Ultra, for example, with that budget, you could definitely afford three across the front. You could afford the left, center, and right or, all from the SVS Ultra series, and that's what I yeah. would do. Um, so, I mean, RBH is definitely going to be in here. You could consider the oh. signature series. Um, you know, yeah, for auditioning sure. them is going to be a bit tricky, but you're, you're within the price range. And those are definitely very neutral speakers that will work very right. well with Aperion if those are being paired with them. Uh, and I would, of course, mention Ascend as well. Um, now that is going to have a different sound to it if you go for the Raoul Ribbon tweeters, but you don't have to go for the Raoul Ribbon tweeters. You could opt for the Dome tweeters, which are the, the default tweeter. The, the Raoul Ribbon tweeters, right. as much as I talk about them, are actually an optional upgrade. Uh, the default is to come with a uh, with a Dome tweeter. So yeah, I, I would look at the, uh, the Sierra series from Ascend as well, for sure. Yeah, and you know, you get the you, you listen to the towers, you get the, or you know the speakers. It doesn't have to be towers. I'm not, you're, I don't know how far away you're sitting mm -hmm. here, but you you listen to the uh, the speakers and you decide whether or not you like them, and then you listen to them with your current center right. and you make that decision whether or not this is going to work. Yeah. I mean, I had the, t the back in the day what was turned into EMP Tech. I had the TK series mm -hmm. from uh, RBH, and their center channel paired really well with almost every speaker I had in my system uh, until I got to something that had more of a not exactly flat frequency mm -hmm. response, in which case then it started to stand out. Uh, and that was a, I mean, I don't even remember how much that, that center channel was, but it wasn't that expensive. It was fine. Now, would a bigger center have been better? Probably, but as far as just watching movies and stuff, you, I, I was fine with having that smaller center sure. in there. So you might be able to, you know, find the speakers of your dreams and say, well, you know, the center is actually kind of holding up pretty well. I'll live with this for a while before I decide to, whether or not I'm going to buy it. Or you may, like Rob said, let's go, ooh, that's not going to happen. Yeah. And just get the get the three. $5,000, like a pair, is not like a price point that you see it ton of there's not like mm. it's not like the thousand dollars and the two thousand dollars a pair yeah. and then it kind of jumps to 10 but, in a lot of cases <laughs> yeah it's it's very strange you know you might see you might see some in between but usually yeah it kind of goes from two to twenty two two thousand to twenty five hundred a pair up to about 10 yeah. and in between there's like a smattering yeah, some so there's not going to be stuff. a ton of offerings yeah. there but i mean so he's, he's you saying may, where to start his search right yeah uh, where yeah. to start his search svs ultra aperion varus grand rbh signature and ascend sierra speakers you you listen to all four of those that's a murderer's row of where to right. start in my opinion and if none of those and then you have vote, you come on back you look at your you look at your uh local you know dealers and say and you give them a call you know as far right. as like the 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 higher end stores uh figure out what they offer what they have on hand to listen to and then f find out what they're doing as far as maybe they're taking appointments how whether they're covid you know how comfortable are you going to be going in there if uh you know depending on that what what they do for covid because not everybody is the same i've you know, I've got mom and pop shops around here where the mom and pop have just given up and they're just like, we're not wearing masks anymore. That's it. <laughs> I'm like, well, I guess I'm not shopping here. So uh, Revel, Revel oh, and yeah, uh, Focal 
would yep. be the other two brands Store I would brands, probably yeah. put on my personal short list. Okay. If I were going to go out there and listen to stuff, I would be looking at Kef, of course, too, has got a lot of good offerings out there. I don't know they have much in the five thousand dollar range, right. <laughs> you know. But they, but Revel, uh, Revel, and uh, Focal will. So those are the two. He says he also has two Amazon Basics digital coax cables. They seem to work fine. It only costs six dollars. Would upgrading those make any difference? Nope. No, I mean, I couldn't say no strong enough. Not <laughs> just, even a little bit. Somebody, somebody re- replied to one of the older articles on AV Gadgets about, uh, I, I can't remember what the article was about. I didn't write it. It was one of the Clint's articles. But it was uh, something about, like, uh, taming high-end energy and, you mm. know, stuff like that. And they're like, would switching from 16 gauge to 14 gauge speaker <laughs> wire help? I'm like, if your speakers are miles away, maybe. <laughs> like, if, the, if you have a 300 miles of speaker wire, no, th- this is, that's not going to make any difference. Y- your coax are just fine. Yeah. You would know if they weren't because they'd be picking up radio. <laughs> <laughs> any any 75 ohm coaxial RCA plug yeah. cable is going to be fine. Amazon Basics, they build them right. They're totally fine. And they've got completely mm-hmm. adequate shielding. Yeah. Terry. Terry would like to hear a bit more about using an anamorphic lens with a projector versus simply zooming in and out. Do we have actual measurements that show how much light ends up hitting the screen in either case? To be clear, he's always thought an anamorphic lens would be more trouble than it's worth, especially once several projectors started including lens memories, but some people still make an argument for that. So he would just like us to elaborate and sort that the, that out. So I'm going to tell you what the, what the, the discussion is, and Rob's going to give you the the numbers or whatever you okay. looked up because I didn't do this. <laughs> so the idea here is that zooming in and out, right? What you're doing is the image itself on the on uh, that you are seeing on uh, that is being displayed has the black bars at the top and the bottom. Mm-hmm. So you zoom out or zoom in so that the black bars are being shown on the top or the bottom, off the top and the bottom of the screen. So they're being projected on the wall and the screen is just getting that strip in the middle. Mm-hmm. So if you have a 2.35 to one screen That's right. and you were you were showing a 16 by nine image, it would have nothing projected to the sides of it because it would fit within that 2.35 to one. And then there would be quote unquote black bars on the left and right with it. There's, but that's nothing being projected yep, there. Just okay? blank. But then when you got a 2.35 to one image, you would zoom it out or in or whatever it's called. I think it's out. Zoom it out so that the black the, the, the image now goes left to right and hits the edges of the screen. The black bars, which are being projected by the projector, mm-hmm. or will be projected above and below. Yeah. Okay. So that thought is that the amount of light that's coming out of the projector is less because part of it is being blocked by the black bars mm-hmm. on the bottom and the top that are not really showing anything, okay? The anamorphic lens system, what it does is it uses the entire panel, okay? The entire the entire image is being shot out of the, the lens, you know, using all of the available light of, this is the theory, all of the light, but the, the processing within the, the projector stretches it yeah, top to vertically. bottom. Yeah, so everyone would look tall and skinny. If you just project it up on the wall, it would look tall and skinny, yeah. right? But then you put the anamorphic lens in front mm-hmm. of it, and it, through optics, through the lens itself, str- you know, basically stretches it back out uh, side to side yeah. so that it looks right. If you, if you remember watching on TV or uh, early versions, VHS versions of Halloween... Mm-hmm. Okay, when they're when uh, Jamie Lee Le- Le- Curtis and her friends are walking down the street at the very beginning, they look very, very tall and very, very skinny. <laughs> it's because they've taken the the two point three five to one and they've smooshed it to be on the four to three screen, right. <laughs> which is what we all had back then, right? Is a so basically imagine that that's what your the, the processing with the projector is is putting out that image mm-hmm. and then you put a lens in front of it so that when you see it, it looks stretched out in the in the right aspect ratio. So the thought there is that since we're using the whole lens and all of the available light there it is going to be brighter on the screen than if you were to zoom in and out and lose some of the light to projecting the black bars that's been the argument and i think i've even made that argument before and rob argued with me back then about it (laughs) and 
corrected me. So I have been wrong about this as well. That's why I'm going to let Rob tell you how right he is. So, I mean, in, in terms of calculating it or the numbers, it's a little bit dependent projector to projector because not every projector is exactly the same. Uh, but all projectors, when you zoom the image, so this is you don't have an anamorphic lens, but when you zoom the image so that it is in fact a larger image now, it is now filling the entire width of your scope screen uh, and the black bars are being projected physically above and below the borders of your scope screen. When you do that, that image gets brighter when you, when you make it uh, bigger like that. And when you zoom it back, I, I say that zooming in because zooming in to me means the image gets bigger. Anyway, whatever that's semantics uh when you zoom back yeah, out so I that know. the image the entire image uh coming out of the projector uh fills the height of the screen but there's blanks on the left and right the image the entire image is now smaller and that image gets dimmer so when you leave the projector at that zoom level it's it's filling the entire height of the screen but leaving blank on the left and right of your scope screen and then you have an image that is normally it has black bars above and below it but then the projector uh processes it so it stretches everybody vertically and they get all tall and skinny and then you put an actual physical lens in front of that and stretch that whole thing width wise well the zoom hasn't changed the zoom is exactly the same so it's still dimmer than if you had just zoomed the projector to fill the entire screen so they're saying, okay, well, yes, more light is coming out than when there are the black bars being projected. Uh, and it's about somewhere in the range of about 20%. It's about 20% brighter than if you're using that panel to project, uh, you know, the black bars at the top and the bottom. But most projectors, once you zoom them to the same relative size to fill the entire width and cast black bars above and below, get about 20% brighter. <laughs> so it's it's almost always a wash. If it's not an exact wash, it's really close to it. You know, one of them will be 17% and the other one will be 20. Or one of them will be 20 and the other one will be 23. But it's, you know, kind of splitting hairs. And unless you had it side by side, you wouldn't see the difference. So uh, Projector Central has, has gone through this. Uh, Projector Reviews has gone through this, through this a number of times and talked about, you know, here's how much light you gain and lose using the zoom. And then you know, you, you keep that same size, but just stretch, stretch everything through the anamorphic lens. And it's like, well, you were starting with the lower light amount, you lose a little bit of that light to the uh, going through the lens, but then you gain some of the light by having the black bars uh, involved. The thing that I never liked about the anamorphic lens system was that you are doing that processing to stretch the image. You no longer have right. one to one pixel mapping, right? If you have a 1080p projector and you're showing a Blu-ray on it, every single pixel was mapped exactly to a pixel on the display. Once you stretch it, you've gone away from that. You've scaled it. You, you've, you've distorted the image on purpose, but you've distorted the image. You have no one to one pixel mapping anymore. So, you know, you can have artifacts as a result of that. And then the lenses themselves, unless you get a really high quality one, those can put in a little bit of distortion and artifacts. Plus there's the cost involved. So to me, it just doesn't make right. sense. Now there's the one case, which is that if you aren't absorbing the light above and below your projector, could you potentially see a bit of a glow when you just zoom it and have right. black bars being projected above and below? Because even the best projectors, the black bars aren't truly 100% black, and especially if you're using a lower cost. Like if you say an Epson 4000 or an Epson 4010, really nice projector, has the motorized lens, has the lens memory, but the black bars are not inky, inky black. It's not ultra black. So if you have you know a light-colored reflective wall above and below your screen, you might actually see that light glowing above and below, and that can be an argument people make for having their scope screen and their anamorphic lens. Um, and that's fine. You, you can go ahead and make that argument. But I mean, if you were getting that projector because it cost less, are you going to spend several thousands of dollars on an anamorphic lens? Or could you could you just use that money to put some curtains above and below your screen and save yourself thousands of dollars? So yeah, that's 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 that, Terry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I... Um... I, I have experienced anamorphic lenses in the past, mm -hmm. especially at uh, uh, CES and, sure. and some of those shows. They'll they'll have uh, the big room set up where they have like a, a wolf projector or something. I think that's what they're called, yep. wolf. There, there's a couple of them that, that require like a big hood and its own AC. And mm -hmm. they have it, it's projecting like a, you know, 200, 300 inch diagonal image and everything else. And you see the the lens go across it and stuff like that, and everybody in the room is very very impressed. Sure. You know who's not impressed? 
anybody that doesn't know what the heck an anamorphic lens is, which is like everybody oh, you know, okay. everybody you know is like, uh, what's happening? How come it looks stupid? What's happening? Oh, huh. That was weird. My TV doesn't do that. No. <laughs> <laughs> my tv just does it right the first time it doesn't need help and then you have to sit there for five minutes explaining it to him yeah it's uh i'm i i understand the the you know the, the idea of anamorphic lenses i think i the thing that gets me more than anything else is the processing the yeah. fact that you you you're not getting it raw in that state uh which you know you could make the argument that um in older times when films were actually on you know shipped around in films it may have been filmed or processed in that state where it was stretched out and you needed the anamorphic lens to put it back but it it was then putting out an image that was meant to be stretched not one that you crunched up so that just so you could stretch it so i i've just not a proponent of this technology i don't like it i don't i don't think it's worth it and i would rather just do the zoom thing all right daz Ever since getting his Emotiva XBA 3 amp and using it with his Denon X4400H his, to power his front three speakers, he's actually found that there are levels uh, the, that he tends to listen at lower volume than before. It's just comfortable at a lower volume now. Is that typical? Why or why, why not? It's not typical. I don't know why this would be. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out a reason oh, why you well, would I mean, it can at certainly lower volumes. happen when you get uh, better amplification, you get a lower noise floor and maybe a little bit less distortion. And you find that listening at lower levels, you're still getting all the clarity that you used to have to turn the volume up before if you had a higher noise floor before. That that can be the case. Yeah, I suppose. I always, I, I often think about that in the opposite direction, though. It's like mm -hmm. you only turn it up so loud because after a certain volume, it started to distort. And even though you weren't necessarily recognizing it as distortion, you recognize it as being not pleasant. But then you, now that you have better amplification with lo lower noise for, mm. floor and less distortion, you can turn it up louder. So I guess it can go both ways. I didn't really think about it in the opposite direction, but you know, Rob's got a point. Uh, he's had his two subs positioned, one at the front, one at the back for a while now. He discovered that turning one of them 90 degrees resulted in the most uniform bass response yet. What's up with that? that uh, don't think that that did anything? No, I mean, he <laughs> could have turned the phase the... knob and probably achieved the same results. I mean, you, you altered I the phase slightly of the subwoofer by doing slightly. that. Slightly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it not did. a ton, but yeah. So I'm I, I I mean anything that works for you, man. Mm -hmm. You're in your own room. Just keep tweaking. So he's experimented a bit and found that he prefers goosing his overhead speakers just a little bit. Literally, just one or two dB. Odyssey doesn't agree, but is that okay? It's your room, and Odyssey isn't the boss of you. So yes, yes. you. It is your room. One hundred percent okay. Like, I would also guess that uh yeah if you're up mixing, <laughs> oh i wasn't just gonna say well that too but i was gonna guess that if you're up mixing that you'll probably prefer the dts neural x DTS, up yeah. mixer because it yeah. tends to goose the overheads more than the dolby surround up mixer does so we've i say this all i feel like i say it a lot but maybe i don't say it enough and that is i literally don't care what you do to your speakers your levels your locations of your speakers once you get everything set up in your room properly, you know, I want what I want you to do is start from a baseline of this is where this is where the, I'm the the recommendations for my subs to be set are. This is what Odyssey suggests that I have all these trim levels. And really, that's not Odyssey. That's your receiver that does the 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 receiver manufacturer is doing the the level matching and all that stuff but this is what odyssey recommends this is what this is where i should have my projector this is where i should have you know the lights or whatever um and then you say but i prefer it when and then you i don't at this point i don't care i think that it's just important that we all start off from a point of you know, uh, where we have set it up the way that it was meant to be set up. If you decide that you want it, your image to be slightly redder after that, even though it, it displeases me and I don't like the way it looks, it doesn't matter. It's not my home, you know, as long as it's good for you. So we've mentioned Sonus a few times as in-ceiling speaker options, but they don't seem to be our go-to. Why not? They're pricey, right? They, Isn't that why they we typically suggest other are. things? Yeah, uh, yeah, every so often, and and on a fairly regular basis, uh, the ones that they sell at Best Buy go on sale. And when that happens, I'm mm. all over them because they're good speakers. Right. And when they're on sale, they're fine. But when they're not on sale, they're a little bit pricey, and that's that's yeah. really the only reason, Des. 
I didn't, it, we are very focused on price around here and well, saving value. people money. Yeah. yeah. So yes, uh, that happens more often than not. That's also why we tend to recommend online brands over big box brands. Sure. It's not because the big box brands like Klipsch and you know uh, all the other ones they don't make good quality products. They do. They just have a lot more overhead than the online guys do, so they tend to be more expensive. I, it, you know, you can buy Paradigm or you know Monitor Audio or you know uh, Clips or Caf or any of these other speakers, and you can get a fantastic pair of speakers. Uh, we just tend to recommend the online ones because they're cheaper. So we saw the uh, Zap Zapiti Zapiti NAS Rip 4K which is a NAS server with a disk drive built in. They say you can pop in a disk and it will automatically rip it and make it available to play on your Zappa TD whatever <laughs> system. Virtually, don't really don't care. <laughs> Virtually, I'm never talking about this again. Virtually no configuration or effort needed. Pretty cool, but a bit expensive at $3,500. But that's without any hard drives in the NAS yet. Mm-hmm. $3,500, dude. It should come with a lot of the drives, like all <laughs> the drives. Daz would like to do the same thing with Plex so they doesn't need a separate computer for backing up disks and then putting converted MK... The v files on to his NAS himself. Can we offer any suggestions for parts and <clears> setup? <throat> <laughs> he just wants a he just wants to stick a disc in there and have it do it all itself. Yeah. I, I, if you do, Daz, Daz, if you do create this, you should sell it for thirty four hundred dollars <laughs> because clearly there's a market for it. And if you make it easier to say, I'll talk about it because I'm not talking about this again because that's a dumb name and I'm not saying it. <laughs> So there you go. So um, yeah, the, the, I, I certainly don't know of a an easy way to do this. I'm sure it is physically possible to. I mean, it is definitely possible to get a NAS unit with an optical drive uh, that goes into it. I'm sure somebody could write the scripts and the programs to right. uh, automate make MKV to to do this. Uh, I'm sure it's theoretically possible. I yeah. I haven't. I, I mean, some yeah. like if you think about like Disney discs and stuff like that, right. where they'll have like multiple copies, and you have to find the right one or something. Or oh yes, yeah. You because know, I remember Lionsgate having to do in that. particular does that all the time. Yeah, so it, that's sort of their. I mean, I just don't see how you can truly automate it without putting in some sort of encryption breaking stuff. Right. Which the the big big difference I, here I is Zapiti can play back. Uh, just dot ISO files, which is just an image of the entire disk, and they can play back uh, M2TS and um, uh, what is it, BDMV files, which is just the the file folder structure of the entire disk. Zapiti can do that. Plex cannot. Uh, Plex won't play ISO files. Plex won't play BDMV files. That's why you have to use Make MKV in the case of Plex to turn it into an MKV file. That's that's why that's necessary. In the case of the Zapiti, uh, I mean, they are using the commercial version of Make MKV. That's that's what's driving it. But all they're mm. doing is the backup the entire disk option, which is much ah. easier to automate than sure, 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 you know, sure. the the M, the actual Make and MKV process. They're not making an MKV. They're just making a .bdmv file. It's the backup of the entire file fo- uh, structure of the disk. So that's kind of why Zapiti is its own separate system. Uh, I certainly don't know a way to do this in Plex. Uh, yeah, so it's not it's not quite that simple, Daz, I'm afraid. <laughs> hmm. So he has some comments here. His niece and nephew are staying with him, plus his own kids. They fought over who gets to sit where in the theater. So he stuck one piece of their sectional in the front row, and it worked out better than he expected. So this looks like the cup, the coffee cup holder section. He split the. F- oh no, that's that's the oh the no. actual couch, and then yeah, on the what would be the far left hand side if you're facing forward. There's like oh I see one extra so piece had like stuffed two- against the wall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he has got two seats that have the cup holder in the middle right. of the, of them, and then he just—I guess this had space on either side to get past yeah, it. That's right. Uh, and now he's got a, a little piece of the suctional stuck over there. Anyways, he recommended uh, the mono price ten five six five five point one speaker package, the one that looks like the Energy Take Five clone to his uncle. He's got a TV above his fireplace, two couches facing each other, not the TV, and no acoustic treatments at all, but Daz was still impressed by the improvement the speakers made, so that's a good value. Mm -hmm. Lastly, he checked out some DevTech speakers at Magnolia. He agrees with us. They should be set to small and use uh, separate properly positioned subs. Okay, I'm good. That's it. 
Patrick, what is our personal preference, a 1080p Blu-ray disc or streaming in 4K HDR, even though it's a lower bit rate? Well, since I don't have 4K or mm. HDR, I prefer, prefer the 1080p Blu-ray disc. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, I've got to admit, uh, when it's like Disney+, Plus, I'm, uh, I'm going to take that that 4K HDR with Atmos. Yeah. Uh, yep, I'm going to take it. I like HDR. Uh, I am aware that, yes, uh, there's a few little few little things because the bit rate is lower, a few little, um, you know, anomalies in the image and that. But, uh, nah, I like the HDR. That That's my personal preference now. So he wound up returning a pair of audio engine speakers for his desktop setup and wound up with a pair of Kef Q150 bookshelf speakers and two, a small two-channel amp instead. Do we think more people should consider regular bookshelf speakers for computer use, even though we seem to often re recommend audio engine? Uh, so... Regular speakers for computer use are fine. Just remember that regular speakers uh, in the two-channel amp, which is something that I don't necessarily think people need to consider, but I do think that uh, uh, larger speakers are something that people should consider because most of the time when they're looking at computer speakers, they they have limited desk space and yes. all they care about is how small they That's are. That's right. Um, which is why we recommend audio engines because they're small and they sound pretty yeah. good. Uh, regular speakers for this sort of use you have to rec remember that they were designed thinking that you were going to be six ten feet away from these mm -hmm. things so uh the, they're not necessarily designed for for uh uh near field listening it uh, doesn't mean that it won't be good for it all depends on which ones you get yeah, and something like kef it, makes sense because they have that yes. very even dispersion in all directions because of the inherent right. design of their particular type of speaker so that makes a lot of sense but I liked using the, the I think they were rock, called Rockets. Sure. Uh, they are a studio monitor. They, are, they have their own power. They're their self-powered studio monitors, but they're full-size bookshelf speakers. Mm -hmm. uh, and they came with a full-size sub or an option of a full-size sub to go with it. You know, they were harder to hook up. You know, it was all XLR everywhere. <laughs> it was a pain in the butt. But it did allow you to hear, you know, a, a, to get a much louder, much better sound. And studio monitors are designed with like the ultimate flat frequency response in mind. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what they are, are designed to do. So do I think that people can, should consider larger speakers for their desks? Yes. I don't necessarily agree that they should buy regular bookshelf speakers and pair them with a two channel amp, mm. but I do think that it would be nice to have them get larger speakers. But, if you're happy with what you got, that's all that matters. And like Rob said, Kefs would would be a good like the L. I think uh, Clint uses LS50. Sure. For his, yeah, they'd be for fantastic his, <laughs> for his desktop setup. And they're like a f you know, f you know two feet away. We could reach out and touch these things. A lot so of people do who can who can afford it. No, I mean Patrick, yeah. I agree that if sound quality is your number one priority, then of course you can get better sound quality than audio engine. Where where those come up is when people write to us and say they've got to fit this size. What's the best I yeah. can get? And at this price point and then like audio engine that at that size yeah. at that price that's the best i think you can get so th there's a difference there because i mean it's almost always physical size that's right. that's when i turn to that recommendation and you know your kef q150 bookshelf speakers they're like uh well they're about 10 inches deep you know and a lot of people right. it's the depth they just don't have that depth on their desk they just physically can't or don't want to fit it and so yeah i completely agree if sound quality is the number one priority then you're going to make some aesthetic and size compromises to get the better sound quality if you're like nope the size has to be this and the price has to be this well then you got to do the best you can right carlos Carlos started reading online about setting up multiple subwoofers. Now he's more confused than ever. Well, then you read the wrong articles. <laughs> so, I mean, we're here. Uh, if he goes by what Odyssey says for multi QXT32, it gives the two subwoofers different distance settings and tries to match their levels. Then there are numerous different opinions and advice about how it should be done, including some people who insist that you want gain matching, not level matching. Yeah. I know, man. I don't think that I don't think they understand what those words mean. <laughs> but I, I honestly feel like this is like a, an ego Montoya moment. I'm like, you keep using that words. I do not think they mean what you think they mean. Carlos is actually interested in what to do with four subwoofers, not two. So can we sort it out for him? Okay. This is something we say constantly. I've written about it on AV Gadgets as well. Your sub and your room, your subs, subs. and your room 
you know, cannot be separated. Mm -hmm. You cannot look at them independently because they all are part of the same base creation system. Okay. The noise that it, the subwoofer makes is intrinsically connected to the, the room dimensions and the, the, the contents of the room. There is no way to say, and this is why we don't ever care that you don't have a subwoofer that was made by the same manufacturer as your speakers because mm -hmm. they, you know, they are not, they are, as far as timbre goes and all that stuff, it doesn't matter because it's all about it being in the room. So, just like with speakers, you know, you don't look at, uh, you, you don't buy a tweeter and then buy a different mid-range and then buy a different woofer and then stack them on top of each other and call it a speaker. You don't do that because they're all part of the same system that creates the noise. You know, you do, you could do that if you were a speaker designer, but you're not. So you buy a speaker that is all together because it has all the different component parts that it needs and it is designed to work together. Your subwoofer or subwoofers in this case are in a room that they have to work with. So you treat them as one system. So yes, you have four subs. Yes, they are in different locations, but we treat them as one system one base making yeah uh thing entity <laughs> yes so our suggestion and what we do in our theaters is that we tr we put them into one sub and i know that you know obviously and everything else gives you all these other <laughs> options it's because it's hard for people to understand mm -hmm. and because you and, and you're having the same the same issue that all these other people are so odyssey does what people have asked them to do which is i've got two subs how come it's you're treating them as one which they only did at the very very beginning but now they are saying okay well you want me to treat them separately we'll treat them separately for you you can set different distances and <laughs> different levels and everything else because that's what you say you want and that's fine but the reality is is you treat them as one so we suggest and i wrote about this recently as well how to level match these two different sub or in your case four subs is that you would go and you would set them all to the same volume on uh using an spl meter and a test tone so you basically you you run all four of your cables back to, to your to your receiver and plug one at a time into the 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 one output and then tell it to play a test tone at uh, 75 db which is reference volume and then you use your spl meter or the spl app on your phone to get it to be about 70 72 mm -hmm. <laughs> somewhere in that somewhere in that range is where you're literally looking for and then you unplug that one you plug in the second one you do the same thing and you unplug and you keep doing that until you get all four subs matched to the same number if it's 70 make at it your 70 seat, 72 at your primary at seat. your yeah. at your primary seat which should be the one that's front, right in front of the the center channel and equidistant from the left and right Speaker. even if that's not yeah yeah so then you take using y splitters which you'll need three of them i think you'll <laughs> you'll split your subwoofer output and so that you have four inputs going into uh, four cables going into that one output and plug all four of them in at the same time. Then you never touch the back of your subwoofer again. Right. Because they are all, all, all those subwoofers are level. You can call it gain matched. Well, or you can call it level no, matched. I mean, gain I mean, matching is making sure that the gain is set exactly the same on all four subwoofers and then altering the signal that's being sent to them for some reason, which. That's ridiculous. I know. Let's see. <laughs> Yeah, that's that makes no sense whatsoever some people insist this so, is the way it must be done There's absolutely no reason it has to be done that way yeah. um but yeah no. so once you level match the subs yeah. then you run your odyssey and odyssey should treat at that point be able to sub. yeah they will treat it as one sub and sh you should be in that green range yeah. now if it so happens that you are not in the green range then what you'll need to do is go back to that first step plug them in one at a time <laughs> until they say about if it's saying it's too low, then you raise it up a one or two dB for all the subs to you know mm -hmm. each one individually, and then again you'll uh, or if it's too high you'll have to back it down a couple of dB. Just you have, it's a little bit of an iterative process there until Odyssey goes okay yeah those are level matched and then or those are those are in the right the volume, and then uh, and then you just go on with Odyssey and Odyssey tree as one sub yeah and that's what you want that's an overarching the distance, thing to remember yeah. 
Yeah. So once you've got that done, then you just run the LSE and you never touch the back of your subwoofers again. Yeah. The overarching thing to remember, Carlos, is a mono signal, a single subwoofer signal that gets fed to all four of your subwoofers, whether that's through Y splitters or through daisy chaining them. If your subwoofers allow for daisy chaining, you could do it that way too. But it's the exact same signal being sent to all four of your subwoofers. The subwoofers themselves have individual levels set so that they are all level matched at your seat because if your seat were in the very, very center of your room, then they would all have the exact same volume setting. Uh, but if it's not, then you're gonna level match them so that they're level matched at your seat. And uh, yeah, that, that'll be the only difference between the four subs. Now, in terms of figuring out where to position them, if you have a rectangular room, it's easy. You're going to put them at the midpoints of all four of your walls or in all four of your corners. If you don't have right. a rectangular room, well, your life just got very, very difficult. And I would highly <laughs> recommend that instead of doing any of this, you just use the multi-sub optimizer software if you do not have a rectangular room and you still want to try and use four subwoofers. Um, right. You know, that's that's going to have a thing where there are individual uh, phase and level and EQ settings for each of your four subwoofers, but that's all going to be done inside of an external little box. It's all going to be done inside of a mini DSP in all likelihood. You are still only going to have one subwoofer output signal coming from your AV receiver. Uh, and you are right. still only going to have one equalization that at the end of all of what's done inside the mini DSP and the multi-sub optimizer software, there is then one global EQ that is still done by Odyssey and still a mono signal coming out of your AV receivers. So that's right. if you have a non-rectangular right. room, check out the multi-sub optimizer software and follow their instructions. Right. So four subs are you know the problem with four subs is just placing them all properly within your space right so if you had i mean you would want them in all four corners or in the midpoint of all four walls or mirrored right could we do those mirrored if like yeah you, you had the yeah. front and the back midpoint in the so let's just let's just say that you could do the midpoint in the front wall midpoint in the back wall but and you couldn't do the midpoint in the side walls because okay. of doors and stuff like that so then you would have to mirror those on the opposite side is that would that yeah if that you're work? like uh, four feet from the front wall on the left hand side then you'd be four feet from the back wall on the right hand side sure yeah, yeah. Or if you, you know, if you have both of your subs just to the left and right of your center speaker up at the, on the front wall, then you'd have them the same distance apart, both of them on your back wall. You, right. Always across right. the room from each other. Always across the room from each other. Clarence. Clarence would like to upgrade to an acoustically transparent screen with a false wall. He intends to put the false wall 18 inches from in front of the physical fr uh, front wall, which will leave him a, with a viewing distance of 12 feet. He is hoping to keep the price to $1,000 or less, and he isn't convinced that paying considerably more will be worth it. What do we recommend? $1,000 for the screen? Yes. Or $1,000 for the wall? No, $1,000 for the screen. Or both? Just for the screen. Uh, so 12 feet. So I know that uh, Elite Screens makes their acoustically transparent, and... Mm -hmm. I, I was doing some research on screens recently when I was uh, writing an article uh, about what screen materials are best for, or what screen manufacturers are best for each application. Mm -hmm. And uh, screens seem to be in short supply. There's lots <laughs> of there's lots of uh, outages as far as you know who makes what and whether or not they're available in all the different sizes and all of that. So you're going to want to be you know a little bit careful and make sure that you're shopping. Uh, that you're contacting the manufacturers and, and see if they've actually got something or if it's on the way or, or all that. But I know that Elite Screens makes uh, a decent uh, acoustically transparent screen. Uh, the problem has been that you can see the weave if you're sitting close enough, but 12 feet is Should well far fine. enough back. Yeah. Uh, I've been, I've seen that screen in person uh, myself. Uh, I've gotten up close to it. Yes, you can see the weave when you're standing a foot away from it. But, uh, and maybe you can see it if you're, you know, six feet sitting back, but at 12 feet, you should be absolutely fine. Yeah, from Elite Screens, you've got uh, two major choices of their woven fabrics. The Acoustic Pro 1080, uh, which I would tell you to avoid. And then the Acoustic Pro UHD. That's the one to get. So if you want that in a fixed frame, it's the Aeon series fixed frame with yeah. the Acoustic Pro UHD. From 12 feet away, if you can do a 135-inch screen, that's your 45-degree field of view. 
So if that's what you're after, it is under $1,000. For the Aeon Series fixed frame with the Acoustic Pro UHD, it's in stock at the time that we checked this. What are we, January 12th? So at this point, the 135 is in stock. Uh, there's a 120, of course, as well for a little bit lower price. Now, I did want to mention uh, the reason we often consider Seymour AV is because objectively speaking, if you measure it, uh, the color accuracy of the Seymour AV screens is superior to even the Acoustic Pro UHD. Uh, but... The Acoustic Pro UHD is close enough that you can calibrate on the projector side of things to make it accurate. But just objectively speaking, the, the Seymour AV screens are a little bit more color accurate, and the Weave is a little bit tighter. And they do have a less expensive frame, which is their precision frame. From 12 feet away, I would say go ahead with their regular center stage XD material. Uh, but to get the 135, or in their case, 137, inch size, uh, it is a bit more expensive. Uh, it's over $1,000, not tremendously so. It's like, uh, I don't think it's even 1100 It's like just over $1,000 for, uh, for the precision frame, which is their less expensive frame. Uh, but you said $1,000 max, and the Acoustic Pro UHD from Elite Screens will get you there, and that's a good choice. Okay. Uh, I scrolled back up, sorry. Jay. Jay and his wife got new carpet installed in their condo. He got some metal speaker stands with screw holes in the corners where spikes are meant to go. He isn't keen on piercing his new carpet. He would rather decouple than couple. Don't tell your wife that. Uh, whenever possible. He already has some 3M foam on the top plates of the stands to decouple the speakers a little bit. So would putting rubber feet on the bottom of the stands further improve things at all? If nothing else, could they make the stands a bit more stable without resorting to spikes? Okay. In my home theater, all right. Uh, first of all, spikes are a nightmare. Mm. Can I just, 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 just? Uh, you can pierce your carpet a thousand times, and you will never notice it. Sure. Okay, your carpet will be absolutely fine. The problem is, is getting those spikes to be dead on so that there's no wobble right, right, right. when the speaker is moving. Is unless you've got um, uh, the outriggers where you can you can adjust it from the top, which most carpet spikes mm. can't. You mostly have to like tip the tip the stand up and then yep. you know adjust it and everything else. Spikes are a nightmare. In my home theater, what I do in uh, on all of my stands, no feet, <laughs> just take them off. And whatever the the bottom thing is that's down there, it sits on top of the carpet. <laughs> and then I do like what you did, and I put some sort of piece of plastic or uh, rubber or uh, just something into blue tack just to yeah. decouple the, sp the the speaker from the stand and that's all i do i don't use the rubber feet you can i don't you just put the stand directly on the on the carpet yep i'm in total agreement uh i mean if if they are tippy for some reason if your stands with the speakers on them are are it's maybe it's got a really small base or something like that i mean yeah I, you can get some inexpensive rubber feet from the hardware store and i'm sure you can find the right thread that'll fit in there and just do that very inexpensively and and you could go for like the you know the kind of narrower rubber feet that that will actually you know not penetrate the carpet but kind of crush into the carpet at those locations maybe that'll give you a little bit more stable footing but i i, I would definitely just try the speaker no feet uh the stand no feet whatsoever and with the weight of the speaker on top of it if you have the speaker decoupled from the platform that the speaker sits on decoupling again at the bottom of the stand to the floor it's not going to change anything in the sound you've already decoupled no. the thing that is causing vibrations which is the speaker itself from what it's sitting on which is the platform on the top of the stand brian brian found us from the thanksgiving episode via the ht guys feed welcome brian hello <laughs> it's, i'm sorry mary poppins thanks for showing up <laughs> what was that hello <laughs> oh hello hello <laughs> Spoonful. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Going to get content matched. Gonna kick us off of YouTube. <laughs> Brian, uh, Brian has been unhappy with the experience in his theater for 10 years. That is an abusive relationship, Brian, mm -hmm. and you need, to, you need to fix this right now. It's finally time to upgrade. He has a total budget of about 4500 bucks. His room is a strange shape, almost triangle, and it can be enclosed. It has, a, it has circular windows. He lives in Nemo ship. What's it called? What's it called? Oh, uh, 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 oh, come on! Now off the top of my head, it's the Poseidon is it? The, no, it's not called the Poseidon. It's uh, oh god, it's gonna drive me nuts. <laughs> All right, triangle room, circular windows. He lives in the boat. He lives at the, at the at the bow of a boat. That's where he is. 
He's using the Epson 540 UB projector with 125 inch elite screens, uh, motorized roll down screen. Okay, it's a Klipsch Gallery G42 passive sound bar mounted way high up above his projection screen has served as his front three speakers and he has Atlantic Technologies surrounds mounted on the side walls well in front of his seats plus an Atlantic Tech sub. I can see why you don't like mm. it in here that much. I'll be honest with you. Suboptimal. <laughs> More than just to a non-existent bass, muddy sound, and lack of clarity, he is also dissatisfied with the usability. He has to manually black out the circular windows, wait for the projector to warm up, and the screen to roll down, remotely activate the receiver and the subwoofer, and all of that leads to the theater not getting used very much. The plan he has in mind is to get dual SVS subs and some proper front left and right speakers, but keep the passive sound bar as a sensor, keep the projector and screen, move his Atlantic tech surrounds and add surround backs, and then get his wife involved by having her make acoustic drapes that will go on motorized curtain rods, then automate everything with Z-Wave, including adding hue lights, with the idea being that everything can be conveniently triggered before entering the theater. What do we think? How would we spend his $4,500 budget differently? Uh, okay. So I'm looking at this room. Yeah. It is crazy. So <laughs> it is sort of trapezoidal slash whatever, but so there is a, there's two, there's a, there's a, we're going to, I'm going to put it in the orientation of the, of the, the theater itself. Okay. So there is a long wall in front of you mm-hmm. with wall shelving and where his TV lives or a screen lives, That's I guess right. where the motorized screen comes down in front of, then there is a long wall to the right which sort of ends uh, directly to the right of the primary seat, which is almost on the back wall. Then it angles in at about 45 degrees to uh, a pinnacle, which is directly behind the front seat. And then it angles again at 90 degrees off of that to uh, to the left of the primary seat, all the way to the front door, which is kind of angled on the way in and then a little bit behind where the front wall is ends on the left he's got his front left sub or at least that's where he's planning on Mm -hmm. installing these the front left corner and the right sub would be in the pinnacle of the triangle behind him which unfortunately makes sense (laughs) so here we go his current his current uh seats his primary seats there's a primary seat in the in the very back of the room then there's a secondary seat in front of that and then there's a table in front of that and then the screen is way at the front of the room over there and i'm guessing uh how big is this screen again 125 or something like that is yeah big, 125 right? and he's only he's like the the primary seat which are the back seats they're only 12 feet from that screen so the yes. the, the seats yes. in front are like you know i don't know He's got them very close together, so I guess it's more than six feet, but they got to be maybe seven or eight feet, the, seat, the seats in front. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, what we... Th- what, all of this, all of, aside from the, the using a, the front three speakers in the sound bar, mm. uh, all of this could have been fixed by getting a smaller screen, basically, and sitting in the secondary seats. Then he doesn't right. have to move his, his surrounds. Uh, then he's more towards the middle of the room and not so far back against the back wall where he's probably getting tons of just oodles of yeah, this is reflections problematic with back the, there. <laughs> lots yeah. of problematic setup there. Plus, I mean, so I mean, I I just want to dive right in to immediately telling you that I don't think if if one of the things you've been unhappy with is how much yeah. you have to manually do to get this room ready to go. Yeah, you're envisioning, <laughs> and I don't blame you because this is the way it's marketed. You're envisioning that somehow Z-Wave is going to make your life easier. It is not. Yeah. It, is not it is not going to make your no. life easier. It is going to make your life more complicated, and more complex, and a bigger headache, and more troubleshooting than you ever thought possible. And I do <laughs> not think you are going to be happy. I think you will end up never using this room versus rarely if you go through with this plan. I'm sorry to put it so 
bluntly, but that is what I genuinely believe having tried to go through some of this stuff. If you think it's going to be this wonderland where you're not even in your theater yet and you get on your phone or a tablet that's mounted to a wall and you say it's movie time and downstairs the curtains are going to close and the hue lights are going to dim and the projector is going to fire up and the screen is going to come down like, yeah, yeah, that's technically all possible. And then the number of times that one of those things isn't going to fire correctly or you, God forbid, try to add a new component to your system. I, I'm just telling you that I don't think this is what you should do. You, you, you ask us ultimately, how would we spend your money? I would not take, he, he proposed a sort of, you know, broken down budget where he's going to put like $2,000 into new speakers and $1,500 into the automation and stuff. I'm like, no, that is not how I would spend your money. I, I would not try to do this. So overall, I'm going to suggest we move in a different direction. Yeah, um, I agree uh, completely. So it's very hard to, to adequately describe this room. It has got... Uh, the front has got what he calls a bookshelf or something, but it looks more like a. It's like I mean, it looks like you know those post oh, oh. office box drawers. Is yeah, what it looks you, like. you know those those those. Sometimes you'll go into like the you know the hippy dippy place or something like that, and they'll have like this weird cabinet that looks like it has a bunch of very small mm -hmm. little drawers for it, and people are like, oh, it's an apothecary, whatever. And you're supposed to put like herbs and whatever. This is what it looks like, but bigger, like sure, bigger than that. But it's floor to ceiling. It's all the way to the ceiling. So his screen comes down in front of that. Yeah, and I'm so quite that, sure that's why his clip yes. soundbar ended up so high because he didn't want to block the drawers if he's if he's getting to those drawers on that front wall then i imagine that's why it's like that yeah so he is planning on getting proper front speakers is that what he said but where is he gonna yeah. put them i guess on stands i guess on stands question yeah. Mats? Question mark? Yeah. so the screen is offset to the right it, mm. it, if there are there's like one row of these lockers or whatever shelves drawers on the right and there's one two three and a half to the left and the couches are pushed to the right wall a little bit i guess to sort of be in line but still sure. it's a little off from some of that is just because of the shape of the room too because of the way the back yeah. of the room is shaped with the yeah the 45 degree angles but different lengths at the back of the room so there's a lot of things i'm going to suggest in here and none of them involve surround back speakers i'm going to just, yeah, let's, just tell you that let's right now get, <laughs> get away from that 5.2 5.2 adding adding speakers to this room is a bad idea i mean in fact the way uh, that he shows things currently set up like just keep what is currently his surround backs which are on the two 45 degree angled walls like j j that's it just keep those get rid of the ones that are in front that are on the side walls uh, you, yeah. those are superfluous you don't need those just keep the ones that are on the 45 degree angle walls and those are now your surrounds and you have a 5.2 system right so I'm not seeing the circular windows anywhere in any of these pictures. So uh, the actual picture of the room there, uh, it's, let's see here. Whoops. I didn't mean I to don't, do that. I see a squarish looking window, but maybe it goes to a circle over there. No, no. Um, behind the seats, there are circles. <laughs> if you can see the image where they're, uh, where you're seeing. Oh, behind. I didn't go that far back. Oh, yeah, yeah. I see it. Behind the seats there, though. Those are the circles. Those couches are literally pushed directly together to each other I know. yeah 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 that's yeah <laughs> so uh so i mean uh, i get like the whole motorized curtain thing i'm like I i'm perfectly fine with with having your wife uh make curtains make drapes i just i don't think they need to be motorized like i know you're envisioning this so whole either. cool i push a button and everything slides into place idea but i'm like nah, just save piles of money and have, I mean, by all means, have curtains that can close the windows. But, like, okay, I mean, do we want him to keep a projection set up? That's really what it, this boils down to. Is is there a way? I think he, I, I mean, I don't see how he gets away from it in in this. Yeah. The, unless if, he's going to have, a, he loses complete access to that, whatever that is. Well, I mean, he could have, he could have a nice big flat panel on a three-in-one stand that has wheels that you can move out of the way you can roll it out of the way quite easily oh i i just can't imagine what he's using that back thing for That's i don't know yeah and i don't know here. if this like it does this room get serve other purposes i mean it seems to be set up 
to just be a theater, but do, does it yeah. serve other purposes that the screen must go away? Or was this a matter of accessing those drawers that are behind? Because if it's, if it's only a matter of accessing the drawers that are behind and you're not having like clients come in here or something and it's used as an office space or something like that, if it's just a matter of getting access to those drawers that are on that front wall, I think you go three in one stand uh, and get one of the three-in-one stands that has casters on the bottom so that you can, when needed, move a flat panel out of the way. Now you can have... It kind of begs the question, if that, if that's the case, though, yeah. if he never if he doesn't ever really need to get back there, why is he retracting this thing at all? <laughs> Just leave it down. Then you don't have to motorize right. it. Uh, okay. As far as this motorization thing goes, and you trying to make everything do by a push of a button... You don't need Z-Wave to make this happen, mm. all right? There's already existing systems that make this happen. It's called Harmony, and it's their hub remotes, sure. and you have to find one if there's one that's out there. <laughs> there are motorized drapes that are just like the cell drapes and the other things yeah. that you can buy, and you could put over those windows, which are motorized and IR, and they will work with Harmony, which means you just have to buy a Harmony, make sure that the sensors are where they're supposed to be and so that they can hit the drapes that you're looking for and they will close the drapes, the blackout drapes that, that can go over those wall, uh, those windows right there. Your wife doesn't have to make them. You don't have to program it. And if the Harmony, if it doesn't do it right, Harmony has a help button. You press the help and it says, did this fix the problem? And this fix, and you just keep pressing no until it gets to the thing where it tries to close the drapes and then they'll close the drapes. Uh, that would, that I think that home automation part of it can be solved with a Harmony and buying off the shelf drapes that are IR controlled that work with Harmony. Uh, I don't think you need to do the rest of it. The hue, lighting, and all that other stuff, that's <laughs> fine. Uh, it seems like more trouble than it's worth when really all you really want to do is turn the lights off most of the time. I don't know that you need to have anything else. Um, Rob's right. If, uh, you know, if, if you just went with... Uh, so, just so you guys understand how this couch system works. He's got two basically futons that are leather yeah. looking okay and the the back the back lays down so that you could lie down on the on the on, right. a, on a flat futon right or you can push the back up and you can sit on the futon well he's got these pushed together so that one side of it well he's showing us but you know so that you could sit on the the, the back row with it with everything you know, laying down in front of you, it's a nice flat surface for you to recline your legs out on and you can snuggle and do all these other things without having, you know, so it's like, like almost like the lounge part of one of those sectionals. You know, you have that one big mm -hmm. long thing that sticks out that looks like it has, it's now the whole couch looks like that if you want it to. Or you could kick up the backs of the middle of the front seat and then sit even further forward. Now you have two rows of seats. So they are very, very close together. And I like, I kind of like this. I kind of mm -hmm. like what he's done here. It doesn't look super comfortable to me, but I'm not sitting on it. So what do I know? Um, there's a lot of ways that you could fix your problems that, uh, that just involve, like Rob said, not, uh, not really buying all that much. Right. The number one thing you need to do in here, no matter what else, is you need to get room treatments. You need to get lots of and lots <laughs> of absorption in here. That back corner, that back apex edge back there where you're planning on putting your sub, it, it should be as thick as thieves in, with insulation back there. Mm. It should be floor to ceiling as much back there as you can. It's a huge point where you've got a lot of... Uh, uh, a lot of reflections going on behind yeah, your head. I'm sure he was need... thinking that the, the drapes would take care of things, but that, no. I mean, the... <laughs> The, the thickness of those drapes and the amount of pleating that you would have to do to, to get it to have any type of acoustic <laughs> impact. I mean... And you would have to... The motor that you would need right. to close the thing, would, would, it would sound like you were closing the gate you know, to a junkyard. <laughs> it, it makes rah. much more sense to treat the walls and then have curtains that, that cover it aesthetically. That makes total right. sense. I'm all on board with that. Um but yeah, I'm not on board with trying to make the, the drapes themselves the actual acoustic treatment. To me, the biggest thing in here is that speaker bar that's above the screen. To me, that that is a right. tremendous issue and probably the, the main reason why you have not been happy with the sound in this room is the positioning of that sound bar up there. I'm going to say to you, because I mean, it seems as though there's a, the main reason it's up there is because he doesn't want a center speaker on a stand that is going to be blocking those, uh, you know, the, the drawers on the front wall. 
if you go with my idea of a flat panel on a three-in-one stand that has casters, well, now the center speaker can live on that stand and moves out of the way when your TV moves out of the way. But if you're going to have to stick with the projector, then I would just forego a center speaker. I would just not have yeah. a center speaker. Yeah. I would have a nice pair. Your seats pair. are not that wide. Yeah, <laughs> I would have a nice pair of front left right speakers um, that are on stands, which I believe is the idea. And I would have a phantom center all day long in this setup, yeah. 100%. Yeah, so uh, where you were planning on putting your surround backs, I would make those surrounds. Yep. I would get rid of the ones that are in front. Yep. Uh, if you can make your screen smaller, <laughs> either by buying a flat mm -hmm. panel or just getting a smaller screen, then you could sit in the front row sure. when you're watching these things and everything will sound better because of it. Uh, you need as much absorption on your, your walls as possible. This room is... I mean, SB two thousand sound fantastic, yep. but SB one thousands would probably also crush this room too. So you might <laughs> That's you might could save a gonna, little money there. I'm gonna uh, argue or niggle over that one. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you know, the base will definitely be better, but uh, I won't say better. If you do nothing but add those subs the base will be more. <laughs> will it be better? <laughs> Unless you start adding absorption and all the other things, I can't say that it will. So uh, Harmony Remote that works with, you know, you know remote control blinds uh, that will also work with your remote, your, your screen means you walk in the room, you press the thing to go, you know, for the thing, the, the, the turn on, well, I mean, you can even do it from your smartphone app before you go into the theater, exactly like you were yeah, talking I, about. I don't quite understand the complaint about how long it takes the projector to warm up, because my projector warms up, and I've got one that's like a billion years older than this one. <laughs> my projector warms up in like 30 seconds. Yep. I mean, but you gotta wait that would it. not stop me from... Uh, that certainly does not slow me down from being in this theater, because, oh, I can't <laughs> wait for 30 seconds. But blocking out the windows and doing some of the other stuff would... So getting the motorized drapes that work with the Harmony Remote, getting the Harmony Remote and uh, adding absorption to this room, I think will make the biggest difference. So you're going to end up with a 4.2 right. system yeah. with a Phantom Center. Yeah. And uh, I think everything will sound a lot better as long as you do the absorption yeah, part. you got to get that speaker away from the ceiling, the front yeah. speaker. Yeah, I agree. I would sell that thing. All right, is that it? Anything else? That I mean, was it and for him. Believe me, dude, you've got so much money to spend <laughs> <it's> left over <laughs> that uh, even if you go with the good absorptive panels from Gick or mm -hmm. whoever that are printed and look pretty and have you know images on them and stuff like that, you if you're spending two grand on this, I'd be shocked. Mm. So you've got some money to burn in your in your in your budget. I know this is probably not what you wanted to hear and I know the home theater guys are all about automation. Uh, this is automation. It's just automation that you don't have to program yourself and I will take that every day uh, over something that I have to do myself. All right, when are we on time? I'm all We should have at least 25 minutes with. left. Okay, Lieutenant Sulu and I'm going to bet this is really George Decay, I'm guessing. <laughs> no. So he'd be captain by now. Probably. That's right. I think he, he was captain in one right. of the movies. I'm sure that he was. All right. Lieutenant Sulu's room is open to the left to his kitchen, and there's a dining table at the back of the room behind his couch and home theater area. That's a very common sure. uh, setup. He's got an Integra 11-channel pre-pro and an Integra DTA 70.1 9-channel amp. But for the moment, he's running a 5.1 configuration with B&W CM5, bookshelf front left and right speakers, and the matching B&W center, and the Boston Soundware 5. 4.5 speaker, speakers mounted to his ceiling and surrounds. His sub is a Golden Air Force Field 5, and unfortunately, a second sub isn't going to happen. He's got some BMW in ceiling speakers on hand, so should he get another pair of BMW bookshelf speakers to put at ear level as surrounds? He already has a pair of BMW stands he could use, or he wouldn't mind. Uh, building something. Uh, I don't understand what this all has to do with anything, but see, he's got the Golden Air. No, he's got the Boston Soundware 4.5 speakers mounted to his ceilings as surrounds. Yeah. So if you did that... There's pictures could, down lower for you to see. Oh, I haven't gotten that far. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So if you did that, you could call your ones, this, what were currently your surrounds, your top middles. Sure. Or if they're a little bit further back, I can't tell by the angle here. You could call them, I guess you could call them top rears. Uh, you could. Because they are, look like they look like they're far enough back. Then you could take your B&W in ceilings and put them in front of you and call them top fronts. Yep. And now you've got 
you know, five point one point four. What are those speakers way in the back yes, of the room? So this is the the thing that is this Bose. <laughs> I I don't know. No, I don't think so because those look like maybe a folded ribbon tweeter between two angled woofers. Those, yeah, as far a... as I'm aware, he didn't mention them. I don't think they have anything to do with his home theater setup. They're like, I don't know what those are. There, there's some speakers hanging they out look like back DJ in his speakers, dining room. Yeah, man. they do, and they're on like tripod stands. Right, they're taking right. up a huge footprint. Um, but he yeah. made no mention of those being any part of his home theater setup. So, yeah, that that's that part. Um, so this is Integra Do uh, Atmos, yes? Or oh no? yes, yeah. It's know. it's an 11 okay. channel pre pro. Okay, that's what I thought. So yeah, this this is a fairly easy question to answer sure. because yeah, I would you, you, you t- call your what you currently your surrounds your top backs or top rears, mm-hmm. install the 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 B and W in ceilings as your top fronts, yep. and then put the B and W bookshelves on stands to either side, and got Bob's own. I am completely in agreement with that, and you end up with a five point one point four, which I think answers one of his come upcoming questions. To be honest. <laughs> So if he can get his surrounds at ear level, should he do 5.1.2, 7.1.2, or 5.1.4? Well, it's 5.1.4. 5.1.4. I don't, I mean, I mean, I don't see any reason. Unless you're going to use those two PA speakers at the back. Well, that's, and I, I mean, guess. that's his, he's, he's a, last question is, should he use surround backs? I'm like, I don't know, you got two speakers back there. I don't know what they're doing, but the, I guess those could be, I, 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 I wouldn't. I wouldn't do surround bags in here, but. you. Well, I, I'll be honest with you. He's got nine channels of amplification on yes, hand. yeah. The 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 five point one point yes. four is just a matter of installing the speakers or That's building right. the stands or whatever yeah. he wants to do. Uh, he to get the seven point one point four, he would have to buy. Got to get another or, two channel. Yeah, amp. he would have to buy. Yeah. Yeah, he's got to buy another two channel amp. So that becomes a bigger deal. Uh, you could test it out with by using. I mean, you could initially configure your system to be five point uh, seven point one point two with the ones that you're currently your top. Well, they're your surrounds as being top. Sure, yeah, just label something. them top middle. Just to give yourself sure. an, just to give yourself an idea of whether or not the speakers in the back and would benefit you at all. Um, I, I, I wouldn't do it because it's nah. firing across the top of a table and everything I'd say else. say five point one point four, and you're laughing all the way. So, what do we? Jonathan asks, what do we think of Stroom? S T R U U M. It's supposed to be uh, to launch this spring at $10 a month. I already don't like it. The idea is that there are a ton of smaller streaming services out there. Stroom wants to aggregate all of their content, but then give you credits instead of all you can eat. And you spend those credits on individual movies and TV episodes. So it's meant to be a cheaper way to have access to about 40 different streaming services. But you would pick and choose only certain movies and shows. What are our thoughts? Um autoplay would be an issue in my book <laughs> I, I'm because sure i i fall asleep to watching tv on the regular my wife does my kids are in here constantly streaming i say constantly my kids have a fraction of the screen time that most people's kids do like if they watch two hours of tv a day during the the weekend that's uh not including any movie watching we might do at night just like by themselves mm looking at screens i would be surprised they almost never uh are in here watching tv uh so i i mean i like the idea i don't like paying ten dollars a month for it (laughs) but i like the idea of it uh i i mean here's what i would like even more if yeah. all of these much smaller streaming services, so this is not your Netflix, they're not going after them or Amazon Prime Video or anything like that, Disney Plus. This is about all the niche little, you know, very small streaming services that are out there. If they're having such trouble surviving on their own because they either don't get enough ad revenue or they can't sign up enough people on their own subscription service to make it without all banding together and offering their content through one aggregate supplier... Why don't they just band together? <laughs> like, I I yeah. don't want credits. I'm sorry, we 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 have we have Hulu, right? Because they were trying to we were trying to compete with Netflix. <laughs> now, if you don't want to be a part of Hulu, make your own stupid Hulu and put CBS All right. Access and HBO Max and Peacock and AMC has one Absolutely. too. I think now. every channel has and their own individual. I think. Wait, wait a second. What is it? Um, what's the one? The Criterion Collection. Sure. 
I think yeah. the Criterion One has one. You guys get together, yeah. make a streaming service, split the profits. Yeah. You know, because that's the only way I'm getting your crap. Because I mean, this, this <laughs> idea that to, you're gonna ooh. you're gonna pay Stroom, which wow, what a name! Uh, but you're gonna pay Stroom ten dollars a month. They're gonna give you whatever number of credits, and then you can only watch this number of individual movies and TV episodes. And based upon which ones you want, those services get the share of the revenue. Um, I'm like, uh, that's not going to help anybody. <laughs> you know, Stream's going to take their cut. The, all these aggregate streaming services are going to get teeny tiny little portions of payments. And they already apparently weren't doing well enough on their own. I'm like, just just get together. You're, you're never going to be the size of Netflix. But if you're all there together, all you can eat, that might present enough value that somebody will pay you know, for that instead of every single one of these piecemeal or all of them having ads inserted into everything. So right. I, I understand the idea. I get where whoever it is that put together Stroom, you know, came came up with this idea and thinks that, you know, this is the way of, of aggregating all of these things. But I'm like, no, just aggregate them for real. Get together, guys. That's the way to solve this. Right. Yeah. Dave. Dave asks or says, just a bit of fun to think about. If you took one of today's lower end TVs, let's say a Vizio D series or a TCL 4 series, how far back in time would you have to go for one of those basically to equal the flagship TV from any brand from way back when? Um, I mean, it's not that far, dude, to be honest with you. You think so? <laughs> it's, you know, it, well, okay. I, I, don't, I, don't so think you, the, I don't think you get there because, well, I, I don't know. Maybe if you go back as far I mean, as a CRT and, and, or something. No, no. Well, the D series. I mean, it's an edge lit, yeah. right? It's an edge lit flat yeah. panel with. Because like I, I would take uh, a, they, I they... would take a 1080p plasma over those, you know, and and the like a Pioneer Kuro or a Panasonic plasma would have been the flagship at the time, and I would take one of those over a TCL four series. And I think plasmas actually were like the first flat panels, right? Yeah. LCDs came later. Is that correct? Yeah, the very so, first. I think it was actually yeah. uh, Philips. Had like the very first plasma ever, I think. Might have been. Yeah. Pioneer was in there early. I, I guess if you stayed within the same technology, if you stayed within LCDs, uh, you could get there. Sure. Yeah. You know, if you stick fairly, within LCD, fairly quickly. yeah. Yeah. It wasn't that long ago that, you know, edge lit was like the right. hotness until we all And I could out put some of those edge lit ones that we have today up against some of the CCFL backlit ones that we had back then. Yeah. That, that they can yeah. equal those. So it would have to be prior to there being a decent local dimming option right which was what seven years ago it feels about right about that yeah time? well like my lg lh90 that was one of the earliest yeah. and it was good it remains good um you know but that's like 1080p it doesn't do any of the 4k hdr stuff that you know even a vizio d series does now um okay yeah yeah it's about eight years ago i'd say there you go that's the thought experiment dave <laughs> all right uh wait a second did i skip something i didn't okay another different way to think of things and, and describe them if you took an epson 5050 ub and we forgot about sheer image size for a moment which tvs would we say have an equivalent image that this is basically about trying to manage expectations um well, I haven't seen the 5050, mm. so I don't know for sure. But it, so it's true. It's not true for 4K, right? It is not true 4K. No, it's 1080p that they wobble no. twice per frame. So it's a wobble K. I don't really know that you can you could point to a straight panel that would look exactly the same. Not exactly. Yeah, the I just same. no. Yeah, like my. Because I'm I'm thinking about my my projector, which is a I don't know. It's a UB something mm -hmm. from Epson, and it's got a really good image, and it's newer than my parents samsung plasma mm -hmm. which is old enough that it still had that red bezel oh yes yeah yeah where they tinted the it color was red. Yeah. yeah um and i still think my parents plasma looks better than mm. this this thing does and this is newer mm -hmm. so i don't know I, my I, inclination it's very hard for me to project my inclination is like a sony x800 i think those are pretty close to each other uh, the Sony X800 is not full array local dimming, um, but, you know, I mean, the black levels as good as they are on the 5050 UB. They are not true black. Um, they, they have some grayness to them. There is no local dimming on a, UB, on a 5050 UB. 
Uh, yeah, I th- I think a a Sony X eight hundred H. If you if you looked at one of those, it's so the fifty fifty UB is not going to be as bright on a on a projector sc- size screen. Uh, right. But, you know. Right. I think that's fairly easy to to understand. But I think in an overall sense, it's about that level of quality, which is pretty darn good. And then and then if you do factor in sheer image size, no contest. Right. Julian. Julian says, after our advice last week, Julian found the Kef LS50 speakers on sale, so he picked up a pair to try. He was very impressed with them versus his Q acoustic speakers. So after a quick email check with Rob, he ended up with two pairs of LS50s. That way he can have three matching LS50 speakers across the front of his room and one in reserve just in case. That's right. So that leaves him with a spare LS50. It was cheaper to get two pairs than to get the lone LS50 sensor. He had toyed with the idea of getting a pair of surround back speakers in his setup, but one corner of the back of his room was taken up with a long stove that would make it tough to position the surround backs. So a log? Yes, log stove. Log. You put logs in there there. and you burn to make fire. I I, I, I got got the concept. (laughs) Uh, so what about using that spare LS50 as a single surround back in a 6.2 configuration? Well, I mean, speaker wire is cheap. Oh, mm. that's what I'll say. You can you can try it. Uh, so generally speaking, you want that single speaker to be directly behind you. Mm. It can be problematic with a slap echo off the it screen, off the front of yeah. your room. Uh, but it doesn't always, and therefore it might work for you. Mm-hmm. So... I would say speaker wire is cheap. <laughs> Try it. If you don't like it, don't use and it. And honestly, I mean, it's already there. We we have heard some people looking to get a loan LS50 without paying the full price of the one that they sell as a center. I don't think you would have trouble selling it if you end up not using it. I think you would find it quite easy to sell your one spare LS50 speaker to someone else who's looking for a center. And uh, then it's even cheaper in total. I would agree with that 100,000%. Uh, okay. He likes how the PC2000 cylinder subs would fit, so he's going to get those. And the UK SVS still has the PC2000, and then there's a new PC2000 Pro. It's 150 pounds more uh, for each mm-hmm. one. Are they worth it? Um, it? Do you have 150 pounds for each <laughs> 300 pounds just sitting around with nothing to do right. with it? Then I would get the Pro. If not, I you get the, the other one and laugh your way all the way to the bank because they sound yes. remarkably similar. I mean, I will say in in your room size, it, it an enclosed rectangle, 10 feet by 15 feet, you yeah. absolutely do not need the 2000 Pro for the slightly bit more output uh, headroom that it has over the outgoing 2000 series. So absolutely not do you need it for that. It is purely about if you really, really want the app control. Um, are you a person who is going to be frequently fiddling with the settings of your subs and would enjoy that or are you a person who is going to get this set up essentially once and once you are happy with the setup you will leave it alone and pretty much never touch the subs again uh because if that's if you're the latter then i would say save the money because performance wise the pc 2000 series is absolutely fine for your room so he's still going to use one pair of his q acoustic speakers as surrounds maybe they'll get upgraded later but they should be fine for now since he isn't going to do a pair of surround backs. Could he put his other pair of Q Acoustics bookshelf speakers on top of his surrounds and have them firing up at the ceiling and use them that way for Atmos speakers? You could. You could try <laughs> I don't think it. you should. I, I, would not my top <laughs> I mean, like I said, again, <laughs> speaker work, speaker wire is cheap, yeah. <laughs> so you could you you could try you it. Could try it. Uh, that being said, uh, there is. You know some requ- secret requirements for ap- up- upward firing Atmos speakers that Dolby has. Supposedly, that they won't really tell anybody. <laughs> they won't really right. tell anybody about. Um, I am guessing that your speakers will be just fine. You know, and perform just as well as those <laughs> other ones would, in theory. Uh, I would be that more said, keen would, if you have speakers yeah. on hand and you're eager to give Atmos a try that maybe you take that book, pair of bookshelf Q acoustic speakers and you actually mount them up high. Uh, you could mount them up high on your side walls above where your surround speakers are, or you could try mounting them up high on your front wall and call them front heights. Um, that That's how I would tackle Atmos with speakers that are already on hand. I'm not super keen on 
pointing them up at the ceiling and try. I mean, by all means, try it because it costs you nothing. And I'm you already have right. the speaker wire. You are already running them to those positions. So that, by all means, give it a try. But it's not what I would likely recommend. I would mount them up high. Okay. Uh, for his computer setup, he uses uh, ISO acoustics decoupling platforms. They're mainly handy for allowing him to tilt and aim his speakers, but decoupling his monitors from his desk, desk setup seems to be beneficial for the sound quality too. Should he get more ISO acoustic platforms and use them in his theater? Well, you should decouple like all the speakers. Yes. So, yes. But it doesn't have to be <laughs> the ISO acoustics ones, which are no, it could a little be, bit spendy. Yeah. Um, so it yeah. doesn't have to be those. I mean, if you're using speaker stands, which, you know, LS50s, those are going on stands. Uh, some museum putty. That's what I would get. Uh, Blue tack yeah. or museum putty. Uh, it Not only will that damp your speakers, it will make them very solidly connected. It'll take a lot to knock your speakers off of those stands, but it will still be a damping uh, material instead of just a hard material. So I would save money. I wouldn't go with the isoacoustics, but I'm all in favor of damping beneath your speakers for sure. There you go. All right, last question, Joe. Joe's room will be 17 feet front to back, but at the 13 and a half mark, the ceiling starts to slope down at a steep angle. Joe says that his viewing position has to be at 14 feet from the front wall. Has to be. That's what he so said? the slope part of the ceiling will... That's what he said. Uh, so the slope part of the ceiling will be right above him. Due to the distance, he wants a 135-inch screen. He's looked at the Epson uh, 5050UB and the JVC LXNZ3, which is their laser DLP model. According to the projection calculator, JVC needs to have its lens at least 13 uh, feet 4 inches from the screen, and the Epson needs uh, the lens at least uh, 13 feet Eight inches so the lens can basically be right where the ceiling starts to slope down but the body of the projector will have to go where the ceiling is sloped so uh if you were to put a shelf on the back wall to hold the projector it would be just above his head while sitting down. just like right there <laughs> <laughs> what do we think he should do in terms of mounting the projector do they make ceiling mounts that could attach to the steep angle he wants to be able to pre-wire uh, this is a brand. This looks like a new construction. Is that? What I, yeah, I uh, that he actually yeah. said this. These images aren't actually his room, but these are like a, a planned, you know, house thing where the layouts are basically the same house to house. So that that's what it will right. be. Maybe his place isn't even being built yet, or something like that. It so wasn't... most projector mounts, you know, if you you can mount them to the the wall the the ceiling itself there you know on, the, mm -hmm. on making sure you hit a joist or in your case you could mount them inside the ceiling basically you know so the pole goes up into the ceiling with a they usually have a little cover that you that you can attach there and then uh you could put across the joists just a two by four which you could angle however mm -hmm. you want you know with shimming it up so that you could attach your the bottom of the uh the mount to that two by four and then have it go through the drywall and out into your mm -hmm. room. You could do, if your ceiling is open, you could do it that way. And then the wiring goes up and up in the ceiling. You know, it goes, you can go straight up the pole. You don't ever actually see any of it. You have to have it wired properly and everything else, but you can deal with that with your electrician. Uh, that's one way you could mm -hmm. deal with this and not have to worry about getting a special mount that can mount to the ceiling because your ceiling is presumably not finished yet, in which case you could do it that way. Uh, there, there certainly I mean, are mounts that can do it because there are mounts that are designed for vaulted ceilings. Uh, and that, yeah, that's sure. what it would be. It would be a, a vaulted ceiling mount is what you would go for. Uh, so it certainly can be done. But he's going to want to get this tight as tight as he can to yeah. the ceiling the, that angled ceiling so that it's right I mean, there you, because you certainly don't want to have that in front of right above your you head you could construct uh, a shelf that begins its shelf life on the angled part of the ceiling i presume the roof is on the other side of that One and would that's think. why he, <laughs> he can't really do he can't go he can't build into that into that mm. shelf but yes i see what you're saying uh, you can't build into the angle. If you could build into the angle, then I would make a window. Oh, I see. Well, I wasn't <laughs> you know, thinking of going like you know, like recessing into the into the angle yeah. part. I was thinking that you know, a shelf that is coming out parallel to the floor, but it where it joins the ceiling. Well, that'll just be at an angle. That's all. Yeah. So I mean, 
my solution is not to have your seats where you want them to be <laughs> for whatever reason. That way uh, you could go with a know, slightly smaller screen, like 120 inches, at which if point... If you could go 120, imagine how many of your problems are solved yeah. by just getting an ultra short throw of projector and throwing it at the front of the room. Oh. You'll deal with any of this crap. Or... If you, know you go I mean? 120, you can actually have the projectors mounted to the flat part of your ceiling. That it also yeah. ends up being an option. I mean, the thing is, if if you've really carefully worked it out and the shelf on the flat part of the back wall is going to give you clearance when you're sitting, like, it can be done. But I mean, also remember that you can't necessarily have the shelf starting right where the flat part of your back wall meets the sloped part of your back wall. Like that's going to have to be a really long shelf coming out because there's some yeah. height to the projector. It can't wedge itself into the part where the ceiling meets the, sl uh, the sloped ceiling meets the wall. So it's a challenge no matter what you do. I mean, of course, one option would be to go for a considerably shorter throw projector. Um, but I wonder if these things on the ground he's showing us is supposed to be the couch. I don't know. Well, like I say, he said this isn't even his room in the image. So I know, but I, I'm wondering if that's what that yeah. is. That that's what it's supposed to be. I mean, if it were me, I would turn it and have the <laughs> projector going down the flat wall oh, right. with the with the with the angle part being to the left of the couch. Oh, I see. Okay, yeah. and then you can put the projector where if you want to sit 14 feet away or whatever right. it is, then sit 14 feet away from that. Yeah. And then you get your 135 inch screen and you mount it to the ceiling and have it drop down in front of that window and Bob's your uncle. You know, that's what I would. I mean, you could even theoretically have your seats with their backs against the full flat wall and then have a retractable screen that basically comes down from, you know, like in front of the, the angled part of the ceiling or even mounted to the angled part of the ceiling. That could right. become your screen wall. Uh, you'd have some space behind the screen. But then again, now you're ending up with a, a smaller screen size, same field of view, but smaller screen size. <laughs> I mean, that's yeah potentially another way to I do it. Whenever somebody comes at me with these like very specific, I have to sit exactly right here. Right. I'm like, do you really? I know. Because <laughs> you know, it, it feels like you don't. I mean, I, you'd be surprised how easily couches can be moved. Yes. Uh, la lastly, he says for the Epson 5050UB versus the JVC LXNZ3, he plans on to have the projector running eight hours a day. So does the laser light engine in JVC make more sense? Does the 5050UB look so much better that it would be worth replacing the lamp fairly often? Why on God's green earth would you be running the projector eight hours a day? This is going to be the room's the world's hottest room. <laughs> you better get an AC that that has a zone specifically for this room and a thermostat in here to control it because it's going to be insane. I would go with a flat panel OLED or mm. LCD TV. I would sit closer <laughs> uh, and I would save a ton of money and not do this. I well, mean, it's not I, a ton I, of LCD, money if you're getting an 85 inch. You're not saving a ton of money, but. Well, yeah, but you haven't the, all that heartache and aggravation of <laughs> doing the making this shelf thing work out too or uh, however he's going to mount it uh yeah i would not do that i would do i would do a flat panel lcd and uh you know qled or Q, neo qled or i mean there's 83 neo inch OLEDs OLED coming up uh but no, none of those are 135 inches although like yeah so many problems get solved if you go 120 and literally sit one and a half <laughs> feet closer um which i'm sure your couch can slide one and a half feet closer i'm it, it, there's got to be a reason for it i, 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 don't, I don't, don't know what it is but there's got to be a reason for it but it's just it just boggles my mind that you would spend all this <laughs> aggravation and, and all this extra money just because you don't want to move your couch i mean one and a half feet i i, I get for let for less aggravation saving than this i would get rid of one of my kids <laughs> just right away just so just someone came in and said tom you know, I'm going to take away X amount of aggravation from your life. I need that one. Take him. Mm. He's gone. <laughs> You're but good. But the question as wrote of Epson 5050UB versus JVC LXNZ3, uh, the LXNZ3 is a very nice projector. It's right up there with BenQ's HT 5550. Uh, not their 3550, but the 5550, and the NZ3 is right up there. Plus, it does have that wonderful laser light engine. Um, given the usage that you've described, I would go for that one. Uh, are the black levels quite as black as the Epson 5050UB? No. 
Uh, but that is a pretty small compromise. It's it's color rendition is right up there with the Epson 5050 UB. Um, yeah, you won't have the dimming and the shifting of the colors over time with the laser light engine. Uh, it's a physically slightly smaller projector that that could come in a little bit handy here. It's a technically true 4K. Oh, it's a 1080p panel, but wobbled four times per frame instead of only twice per frame. So yeah, putting it all together, uh, I can make the argument for the NZ3 here. It has ever so slightly shorter throw. So again, if, if you can just mount it to the flat part of your ceiling and go with a 120 inch screen, it solves all your problems. Mm. So who we have left, Rob? We have Dale W, Manuel S, and Dean R. Yep, that's it. That's Plus whatever bad. came in on Monday and uh, Tuesday. All right. If you want to get your question answered on this podcast, all you have to do is ask. You ask by emailing us a question at avrent.com. We want to thank our listeners of the week. We want to thank Brian, Julian, Lee, and Dale. I don't know where <laughs> that A this? came from. I don't know where that A came from. <laughs> and Dale for uh, going to avrant.com and clicking on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link and leaving us a PayPal donation, as well as our 125 patrons over at patreon.com. Yes, indeed. Brian, Julian, Lee, and Dale, thank you very much for those PayPal donations. Really do appreciate those. And patreon.com slash avrantpodcast. Anybody who would like to sign up for an automatic monthly donation, thanks very much to our 125 patrons over there. We want to thank Jeremy, Mario, and David for sending photos uh, with permission for me to use them on Navy Gadgets, as well as Jack, Terry, Patrick, Brian, Dave, Jason, and Dale for the, their notes of gratitude. Uh -huh. I'll repeat all the names, Jeremy, Mario, and David. Thanks for giving time permission to use your photos in perpetuity over at avgadgets.com. And then Jack, Terry, Patrick, Brian, Dave, Jason, and Dale, thank you very much for the notes of gratitude and encouragement. Really do appreciate it in these times. And thank you to everybody who continues to listen and send in your questions. We appreciate it very much. For AV Rant, I'm Tom Mandry. And I'm Rob H. Now stay in and listen to something. Want your question answered? Send it to question at avrant.com. is A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.